Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. On uh, behalf of the British Municipal Bank, I would like to welcome all of you. I will give a few housekeeping remarks uh, a little bit later on. But first, I would like to uh, give the floor to our governor, Mr. Boris Vujicic, to, to have uh, this welcome speech or introductory presentation. And I hope we will have enough chairs here during the whole event. Mr. Gavar. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, warm welcome to all of you, uh, to the Croatian National Bank, to the Forum on the Digital Euro and the Central Bank Digital Currency. Uh, let me extend a special welcome to Evelyn Wittlux, the Program Manager of the Euro Project at the European Central Bank, to Tamara Perko, who is the President of the Croatian uh, Banking Association, Darko Tipuric, uh, old friend from the University, who is the President of the Croatian Economic Association, and Takeshi Kito from Elevande, Japan, who I have been told helped a lot also in the organization of this uh, event. This is, a, this is a kind of an opening of the discussion on the project of the digital euro in Croatia. Uh, it's not that uh, we have not talked about it before, but uh, with this forum, we kind of uh, tried to launch the uh, wider discussion on the on the digital euro because we think it is the timing now at this stage of the development of the project to have a broader uh, broader discussion and i'm happy to see that uh, we'll have a two excellent panels today that will uh, discuss uh, open issues uh, some which are i would say clear and uncontroversial uh, and some which still uh, uh, ignite different uh, opinions and, uh, and the discussions. Uh, it will be also a good opportunity for the media to ask the questions that they have on the, on the euro and on the project of the digital euro. Uh, and I will also say a few words uh, later on uh, for, the, for the media. Uh, the project is, is only one of the many projects, as you know, in worldwide. There are approximately 100 jurisdictions around the world which deliberate on the central bank digital currencies. There were some who started early, uh, like our friends from Sweden. Uh, there are some who stopped also uh, after a few steps and uh, are now a bit stalled. There are some who have put the project on the back burner. Um, and there are some who have already implemented, uh, at least in the small areas, the, the concept of the central bank digital currencies. You will hear from Evelyn, who is, uh, who is the right person to tell you where we are in the Europe uh, uh, with the development of, of this project. And what are, the, what are the main ideas that we had when we started to well develop the project? One of them is certainly that uh, the uh, central bank money uh, public money is at the moment available only in the form of cash. Uh, the, um, elect the private money, bank, bank's money, when the bank grants a loan and the money appears on your account, that's all, that's all in a digital format, in electronic format. So now with the spread growth in the use of the digital money, we thought that the public should also get a public form of uh, the central bank digital money. And this is one thing that we aim to achieve with uh, launching the uh, European central bank digital currency. The other is the something that we call uh, strategic autonomy, uh, primarily in the, in the area of the payment services, to have an independent European platform for payment ser services independent of non-European uh, providers, which, uh, which gives more resilience to the, to the payment system in Europe, also helps in, in, in uh, uh, technical aspects of cyber attacks, uh, etc. Uh, but of course, there are many, uh, many uh, issues, many questions around the central bank digital currency. Not everything, of course, has been yet decided. It's still a uh, project under development. And I'm sure that uh, uh, as we get the feedback from, from you, 
from, of course, banks who are the very important partners in the in the project because they will have a major role in the in the project. We will be able to to set the the central bank digital currency, digital euro, in the best possible way and most useful way for the citizens, which is in the end the 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 end goal, which is very important. Uh, there has been uh, a lot of uh, uh, I've heard. I've read at the, at, the, at the internet forums worry whether the digital uh, euro will, uh, to some extent, infringe the privacy of the of the citizens. Uh, the conspiracy, conspiracy theories spread very very quickly, and uh, we are there to assure no that the privacy is one of the most important things that uh, we. Uh, take care about in development of the of the digital euro and uh, in the end no uh, having a digital euro and having a central bank behind that might in terms of the privacy be more private than having a private companies behind your your transactions uh, so i hope that the the two panels will also answer these questions and worries that that appear some time uh, and I wish you uh, very nice discussions with panels and then uh, a nice lunch. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Governor. So uh, we will have uh, two panels and there will be some time for each panel at the end of the panel for the questions. I'll take care of the time. So this is why I'm looking at uh, our deputy and she will be moderator. I'll take care that we have enough time for the questions. And now there is the first uh, panel is about the digital euro. Second one is about the CBDC. So each panel will be preceded with the presentation. And I would like to invite uh, Ms. Evelyn Wittlax, program manager of the European Central Bank on the Digital Euro Project. She will give introductory, the introductory presentation to frame the discussion. And then later on, we will have the discussion and questions. So. Ms. Whitlux, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you to the Croatian Central Bank for organizing uh, uh, this event because we find it very important to have an open discussion on the digital euro because the digital euro is something for everybody. So it's good that we have uh, an open discussion uh, uh, in each uh, euro area uh, country. So um, as Croatians, I think you are a special country because you only uh, uh, joined the euro uh, one year ago. Uh, and uh, I hope that you have seen some benefits uh, uh, of the, now being able to pay with the euro, amongst which, for example, that you can take your cash, uh, travel across the euro countries and you can pay wherever you want and you don't need to exchange. Actually, the digital euro will provide something similar, but then in additional form. It would allow you, if you uh, travel, that you can just pay with the same payment means that you use here in Croatia, both in stores, but also uh, online. So um, today I would like to talk you through, as said, uh, through the status of the digital euro uh, and uh, talk you through all the thinking that we have done. But let's start at the beginning, because why? Uh, our, is the euro system, system together, as was said by the governor, already considering uh, a digital uh, euro. And we're not the only central bank. Actually, the majority of central banks are considering a central bank digital currency, which we call, in our case, a uh, digital euro. Uh, so in this presentation, I will take you along three main pillars. So one, it's the natural natural evolution of cash. So it's the adaptation of the current form uh, of uh, central bank money that we have cash. The other one is it will facilitate uh, uh, the life of European citizens. And last but not least, it will strengthen our uh, strategic autonomy. So let me take you through these th three pillars. Um, so the first one is, is that we see that even though uh, the euro system is extremely committed to cash, and stays committed to cash. Uh, as a colleague of mine said, cash is our baby, so we love it. Uh, but what we see is that uh, the people use it less for doing retail payments. So there's a change going uh, ongoing. We saw, for example, that between 2019 and 2022, 
uh, the share of uh, uh, cash payments declined from 72 to 59. So that's really quite a steep uh, decline in only three years' time. I'm coming from the Netherlands. Uh, we have Alexi here coming from Finland, uh, where we have uh, very different figures. For example, in the Netherlands, only one in five transactions is still done uh, with cash. So we, we see a trend that the citizens would like to pay more digitally. So we believe that therefore uh, providing the benefits of uh, cash, which is central bank money, you never think about this like, okay, now I pay with uh, commercial bank money, I pay with uh, central bank money. Um, but it does make a difference. We do see this, of course, if people feel insecure, they go to cash because they think it's a... Uh, it, it's, uh, it's it's their really their money, um, so um, the digital euro would be a, a form of cash, but then put digitally. So uh, we will look to a co couple of the most fe uh, liked features of cash, for example, uh, the fact that you can use it everywhere, uh, uh, the fact that it's uh, highly private. Uh, so these things we really try to in incorporate in the design of the digital euro going forward. I will come back on both of these topics uh, later on. Then next to that, it will make people life easier throughout the euro area. Um, because we have gotten used to it uh, that if you travel or if you travel online, uh, that you need to, uh, you, there's not one way to pay with euro. Uh, so for example, uh, in Germany, if you pay online, it's actually most, uh, mostly PayPal, uh, the only uh, opportunity that is there. If you go to the Netherlands, it's ideal. If you go to Spain, it's Bizum. Um, but it, there's not one way. If you also, for example, want to share uh, a bill amongst, uh, I work in now in the ECB, so I have like uh, colleagues from all over Europe, we cannot digitally share the bill. Uh, we need to pay with cash. So there's really still a lot of use cases where we cannot have one single way to pay with a euro digitally. So with the digital euro, this would be possible. Um, and let me stress again, it will not replace anything. So it will not replace cash and it will not replace the current private means of payments. It will be an additional choice that people can use if they want and they, can't, they don't need to use if they don't want. If we look to the current draft legislation, which is currently at the table, we see also that the digital euro will be granted legal tender. And that, what does this mean practically? It means that if you go to your bank, your bank will be able and will need to provide you with digital euro uh, accounts and a means of payments. While on the other hand, merchants that now currently accept digital payments will need to accept the digital euro. So with that, you can really trust if you have a digital euro, you can travel across Europe and pay wherever you want. Then last but not least, it will tackle some of the geopolitical challenges and uh, strengthen our resilience. So if we look to the current retail payment landscape in Europe, also not something that people normally think about because you just think it, it works, I, I need to pay and it works. You trust actually that it works. Uh, but roughly 70% of our transactions are done over non-European payment rails. And I think for something so essential as payments, uh, which is like water and gas and electricity, you just trust it's there. Um, uh, that should also be the case for, for payments. And this high dependency on non-European payment uh, providers uh, should be a concern of us and would, is, would be something that the digital euro would address. Um, and on, 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 the, on the flip side of that, the digital euro would provide a platform uh, for innovation. As I've just described, the digital euro would be widely accepted uh, and widely used. So uh, actually every citizen in the euro area would be able to pay with the digital euro if they want and every merchant uh, will be able to accept it. Uh, so that also means that if you would want to do innovation on top of payment rails, uh, for example, uh, like conditional payments or stuff, you can build on these rails and you have a reach almost immediately over the whole of Europe. Uh, and uh, last but not least, payments has a tendency it's a network product, uh, so it has a tendency of dominance. Um, uh, and with the digital euro, with, which is a public good, we will make sure that there stays sufficient competition in the market so that we also make sure that the payment system uh, remains uh, 
uh, effective uh, and efficient. So I'm not going to talk you through everything here, but uh, uh, let me uh, tell you what is the gist of this. So the, the digital euro, uh, we now talk as is it, we, we one thing, but it will look a bit uh, uh, different. So we will design it for three use cases so that you can pay, as I said already earlier, per person to person. So I can uh, uh, pay back for, uh, I don't know, a, a restaurant bill if we want to share, for example. It will be available for point of sale, so in-store payments and for e-commerce payments. So these are the three use cases for which the digital euro in its first instance would be designed. Then uh, an important one as well is, is that there will be two types of digital euro. One would be the online one, uh, which might look a bit like a, a payment me that methods that you currently know, but there will also be an offline variant. And the offline variant would mean that you can pay even if there's no internet connection, even if there's no electricity. Uh, but it also provides a very high level of privacy because actually what happens is that there will be two secure elements, which is the chip, for example, in your mobile phone or a, a specific card on which you can store digital euros. And that would be as if you get like 50 euros out of the ATM and you put it in your pocket, but then you put it on the secure element. And then if you want to do a payment, you can hold these two devices close to each other and then the payment has been done. So it means that unlike with an online transaction, it always needs to travel over a network to, it, to get to the other, the bank of the one that you want to pay. But with an offline pa uh, payment, it's really a transaction between two devices. So it's very, very private. Um, on the consumer device, I've said it a lot, so mobile phone will be one, uh, but we also foresee uh, a physical card. And of course, if it can be on the mobile phone, it also will be provided with a web interface. Um, then uh, on the right hand side, you see the technology. So it could be uh, alias based, could be NFC, which is uh, a contactless payment as we do it in the shop uh, or with QR codes. And then last but not least, the way that you could have access to it is actually twofold. So if you have it on your mobile phone, you can easy, uh, either use uh, this via uh, the internet banking environment that your bank uh, provides. Of course, this is dependent if the bank would uh, offer this. Uh, but next to that, there is also the digital euro app, uh, which would be there for the people that would like to use something uh, uh, separately or uh, can also be reused for PSPs that are too small to invest themselves in building these mobile apps. Privacy and data uh, protection. And uh, this is a very important uh, point as was also pointed out by the governor. Uh, and we also got this back uh, from the public consultation we did before we went into the investigation phase that uh, privacy is very important. So let me uh, tell you a couple of things. So um, with the uh, privacy, we look to a, a couple of elements. So one is the end-to-end -end, uh, privacy that would be there. Um, so that starts from, from you doing a payment till uh, receiving the payment. For the online, the le current draft legislation says that the banks need to have access as they have today to your data in order to do AML and CFT uh, 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 checks. Um, for offline, as I already explained a bit earlier, this is differently because those transactions will not go to the bank. They will not go to the bank and they will not go to the, uh, uh, to the European Central Bank. It would be like withdrawing cash from the ATM. So the bank would know that you withdraw 50 euros for offline transactions. And at a certain point in time, if you want to put something from your offline holdings on, uh, on your account again, then we would know that you have put 50 euros back on your account. But all the transactions in between will stay private. Then for the online one, then apart from the banks, there is the part of the euro system and there's a lot of concerns uh, or a lot of concerns. There are people that are concerned about that, about the information that the euro system would have. But let me reassure you, the way that we uh, build the system would be that we cannot connect any transaction to a private individual. And that's much more private than any current private payment means that is there because currently your payment data flows from, from one system to the other without being anonymized. 
But for, uh, uh, for the digital euro, it would be like this. So we would be settling transactions without knowing for whom we do these transactions. Of course, we will be compliant with EU regulations and also with the data protection law. So there is nothing uh, uh, there. So another important element of the digital euro is financial inclusion, and that is a financial digital inclusion, because we uh, have still people that don't have access to bank accounts, but I think we have increasingly more people that find it difficult to follow uh, 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 the digital developments and feel confident that, uh, that they can pay there. So we have really in the design built in features to make it as inclusive and accessible as possible. And we're very happy that quite a number of these uh, uh, points that we have made are also in the draft legislation, which is currently under discussion. Um, so one important element for the consumer organization in this point was that there would also be a physical card. Uh, because peop there are people that find digitalization difficult find a card easier to handle uh, than a mobile phone. Um, but more importantly, because we actually want to make people to, to feel comfort comfortable in the digital world as well, uh, there would be uh, uh, the possibility for users to have uh, access to face-to-face -face technical uh, support um, and also to easily switch from intermediaries. Currently, if you need to close an account and move uh, to another account, that is quite a hassle. But in the design of the digital euro, it will be very easy to switch your account from one provider to the other without losing any of your history. And it means like if you now move from one bank to the other, you get a new uh, account number. For the digital euro, you will always keep your digital euro account number, uh, making this very easy. Um, also, offline uh, is very important, of course, for financial inclusion. Uh, and the last point is that, indeed, the draft legislation said there should be public entities that provide this face-to-face -face, uh, support. So that could be different per country how this is set up. So, as was mentioned also by the governor, uh, the intermediaries, the PSPs, uh, uh, the banks, uh, financial institutions play a key role uh, in, in the ecosystem because they will be the distributors of the digital euro uh, towards the end users and the end users being consumers and merchants. Uh, so we really uh, want to keep the, the current way of working so that we don't disintermediate uh, the PSPs, they keep the primary relationship. So um, a couple of things that are on this slide. So on the left-hand side, you see a couple of these things that we find it important to, to, uh, to keep uh, the current balance. So the digital euro just distribution will be done uh, via PSPs. They will have the customer relation. Uh, and um, we are for the digital euro developing standards to make sure that you can pay everywhere in the euro area. These standards could also be reused for European payment solutions. Uh, and with that, actually, we hope to unlock even further the potential of instant payments. Then uh, from some uh, payment service providers, they are concerned about the impact on liquidity because like cash, the cash is your money, so it's not on the balance of the bank. And for digital euro, it would be the same. It would be uh, uh, on, on our balance sheet and in your pockets, uh, uh, to, to say so. So for that, in order to make sure that this, the, the financial system is this not destabilized, there are a couple of elements in the, the uh, design that should ensure this. One is the holding limits for end users, uh, a waterfall functionality. What does it mean? It, it means that if if there's a holding limit of, say, 3,000, um, and you want to do a, a transaction of 3,005 uh, euros, <laughs> um, you could still do it because you would top up your account and then you would pay. It would also allow you to hold like lower amounts uh, uh, on, on your digital euro account because you can trust that you can always pay. So if you have always 100 euros or 200 euros, and by coincidence, you need to do a, big, uh, a small, uh, bigger payment. This can be done seamlessly. Uh, and last but not least, uh, uh, the your system has said that they will not remunerate uh, the digital euro, so to make it very much like cash. This point I briefly touched upon, uh, and this is the, the payment rails. As I said, 
uh, before, currently roughly 70% of our transactions are running over non-European payment rails. Uh, and we find it important that we have more transactions over European-owned payment rails. Uh, so we will uh, uh, implement the, those when we implement uh, the digital euro. But those rails can also be reused for private solutions, uh, 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 European solutions. And for that, they could much easier scale and roll out uh, than they currently can. And with that, we can really reduce the dependence on other Europe, non-European players. For that, we are working on uh, on a scheme. We do that in a rulebook, uh, in the rulebook development group. And the rulebook development group consists of all the stakeholders, actually. So merchants are represented there, consumers are represented there, and the financial institutions being banks or non-bank financial institutions. Um, and we need that in order to ensure that whatever your bank gives you, like a card or a QR code, that uh, wherever you travel in the euro area, each merchant can uh, accept this. And for that, you need to define these standards. Uh, so it will establish common standards to ensure this pan-European reach and a harmonized payment experience. So not that every time you pay is completely different. Um, on top of that, it will provide this platform for on which they can uh, market players can further innovate. Uh, and as I said before, it allows domestic uh, uh, players to uh, to widen their scope. Um, so let me then come to uh, a bit of the end of what I wanted to say. So we have been working on the investigation phase. That was work we have done between 2021 and October last year. Uh, and there we have worked mainly on uh, the design proposal as well on the technical explorations. We currently are in the preparation phase, which started in November and will last to uh, at the end of 2025. There are four main deliverables that we would have. So the first one is uh, to finalize this rulebook. Why is this important? Because it would make sure that the moment a decision is taken uh, to issue Digital Euro, everybody would know what to implement. Um, so that is important. Uh, the other one is uh, selecting the service providers for the parts that the Euro system needs to provide. So for example, the settlement engine, um, we want to further learn through experimentation, not only on a, techno a technological basis, but also on uh, user experience. And last but not least, we will do further deep dives and also prepare a plan. Uh, might a decision be taken uh, to, uh, to go ahead with the digital euro so that we have a plan to implement. And then at the end of 2025, we will go back to the governing council and then uh, um, we need to see where we are. So important is, of course, the findings of the preparation phase. But what is also important to know is, is that in parallel with us working in the preparation phase, uh, the co-legislators currently are discussing the draft legislation that, which was published by the commission last year, June. Uh, so we will also there, or we are there providing technical support where asked and where needed. Um, and we have, of course, committed ourselves that we will always make sure that uh, uh, the digital euro will stay in line with uh, the design that will be approved by uh, uh, the co-legislators. So with that, I would like to come to a close. Thank you very much and looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. So now we will have a panel discussion on the Digital Euro and the Digital Euro project. Uh, it will last until uh, noon, until 12 o'clock. And we will leave, uh, we will leave last 20 minutes uh, for your questions for the media and for, uh, for the panelists uh, to, to, to join the discussion. Uh, Uh, yeah, I would like to now to invite uh, Ms. Sandra Schwaliak, uh, Deputy Governor. She will moderate this panel on the Digital Euro. Uh, please join us as well, the panelists, uh, Ms. Evelyn Whitlux, uh, uh, Program Director of the Digital Euro, uh, Ms. Tamara Perko, President of the Croatian Banking Association, Ms. Rosa Giovanna Baresi, uh, Professor, uh, Junk Professor at the School of Economics and Management, University of Florence, Ms. Uh, Alexi Grimm, Head of Fintech Bank of Finland, and Mr. Simon Anko, Director Payment and Settlement System 
Bank of Slovenia. I wish you a very productive and fruitful panel. Sandra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leonardo. Uh, do you hear me? Okay, good. So, uh, I have a great privilege today to moderate the, the first panel on Digital Euro. And uh, with us, I have uh, five very prominent uh, experts, uh, starting uh, with uh, Ms. Whitlock, uh, of whom you have already heard. And uh, today with us, there are two additional central bankers, one from Finland, one from Slovenia, Mr. Alex Grimm, Mr. Simon Anko. Uh, and uh, I have uh, the representative of the academia, uh, which, which is great to have uh, someone with that outside or unbiased uh, view, Ms. Uh, uh, Rosa Giovanna Baresi from the University of Florence, and the person whom you probably know because <laughs> it's our uh, 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 Croatian colleague, Ms. Tamara Perko, director of uh, Croatian uh, Bank. Um, I will start this question, uh, this, this uh, panel, with, uh, uh, let us say, uh, even a little bit private question, and that is about your personal role and involvement uh, in Digital Europe project. So, uh, so far, I've been only reading about Digital Euro. I started to understand it, and I start even to love it. Uh, but I haven't seen the real persons behind uh, the project, so it's very nice to, to see someone who really uh, works every day on the project. We can even touch Miss Whitlux. <laughs> so she's real, she's real. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your um, everyday life. So... Uh, and I don't mean per private yeah, life, no, but no, the, no, the, no. the life and uh, your personal involvement in yeah. Digital Europe project. How does it feel to be on top of uh, such an important project? Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. And it's a nice way to open the panel. So thank you for that. So um, maybe a bit on my background. So I was a technical engineer a long time ago, but then I ended up in payments uh, for uh, more than 20 years, always in the commercial uh, sector. And then I joined the ECB for the investigation phase. So I joined uh, at the beginning of, uh, I was in the beginning of 2022. Uh, and um, I, I find it a great privilege uh, to, to work on the digital euro. Um, we have a, a very nice team. So we have a, a, a team of... Uh, mixed team of experts both uh, fr coming from from the ecb but we also have people joining us from the different uh, national central banks uh, and then we have also hired some people from the from the market with specific knowledge um, uh, we work in an open workspace we're the only one uh, currently at the ecb so uh, if i come to i i normally try to go to the office uh, if i'm not traveling um, and there we have uh, uh, the teams really cro working cross-functional because you can imagine that there's almost nothing that you can just think of in isolation. You cannot think about the IT or think about the legal aspects without talking to the colleagues. So it's a very collaborative atmosphere on the floor. And then uh, the program structure is really within the Euro system. So uh, we interact very regularly uh, uh, with uh, the project steering group and the high level task force. And in, then also the governing council we report to regularly. And it's really very good because then we, we get the knowledge from all the separate countries where our payments and in every country, the situation is slightly uh, different. Uh, and we can also see that discussions are slightly different. Like, for example, in Austria, the discussion on cash is much more relevant, while in the Netherlands, they're more concerned about fees. So just to, uh, to make an example. Um, so that's, that's what I, uh, uh, I do. And the, that's the core team uh, of this Digital Europe project. The, the core team. Yeah, yeah. So, people that... well, it's difficult. So, so we have the people, of course, in the in the, in the ECB. But as I said, we work very closely with the with the national uh, central banks uh, as well. Um, so, apart from being in the team a lot, I also uh, I'm a lot in these kind of events. Uh, but we also have uh, big stakeholder groups uh, that we share. So, the ERPB, the European Retail Payments Board, uh, but also the Rural Development Group, because. We really 
it, it, it uh, we aim to uh, to strive that this is really very open and transparent uh, uh, endeavor. Uh, everything we do is also published for that reason, and we we put a lot of time and energy to interact with the uh, stakeholders because we really think we need to do this together and to take everything on board and to avoid a sort of a ivory tower uh, uh, this decisions. But that's a bit how my life looks. So it's half of the time, roughly, I would say, in Frankfurt with the team and half of the time traveling through Europe. Okay, I can imagine. Now I will turn to our uh, representatives of two uh, central banks. Uh, the first one is Slovenia and the second is Finland. I think that the countries are quite different when it comes to uh, digital payments and uh, the the uh, share of digital versus cash payments uh, in the uh, uh, total number of transactions. First, uh, the, the question for uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Simon from uh, Banca Slovenia. So what is your per personal role in this uh, Digital Euro project? Uh, Simon is Director of Payment and Settlement System at uh, Banca Slovenia. That's right. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, my personal role, I've been in payments for 26 years. So maybe a little bit longer than Evelyn has been, but uh, still uh, we have done in this time, uh, we have joined the Euro area, SEPA and so on. Currently, I'm responsible for operations, uh, oversight, supervision, and strategic development. And as concerns digital Euro itself, we have been following uh, stable kinds, uh, Facebook initiatives and so on, now for almost uh, eight, nine years. And uh, for me, everything has really started with the ECB report uh, from October 2020. And from then on, when the high-level task force at the ECB has been established, it was always our goal to be active participants in that uh, high-level task force. And I have to tell that this is one of the goals, strategic goals of the Bank of Slovenia to be active on the project. So uh, we are somehow supporting our member of the high level task force to have our own opinions at the high level task force. But I have to be clear, as you have stressed, uh, countries of the Euro area are very different, but we may argue among ourselves, but we should speak one language to the public. And this is very important because it is the digital euro which will be addressed to all the population of the euro area, 350 million people which do not have the same background. For example, to be very short, in Slovenia, financial inclusion is 99%. Only 1% of people above 15 years does not have a, a bank account. People do not want, they do not need it's not a matter of financial inclusion for Slovenia. For some countries, it may be. But on the other side, only 60% of people are using their smart devices to access their mobile bank or uh, e-banking solutions. So even older people have smartphones, but what they do use them for? YouTube and such things, not for financial services. So we see... Uh, that a lot of communication will have to be done. And Slovenians are really cash lovers. We are the second country from the bottom. Just uh, Malta is ahead of us uh, as concerns the use of cash. More than 70% of payments in volume is made by cash. So this is surprising somehow because uh, people have smart devices, smartphones, but still there is something in cash that people still like. So this is the challenge. And uh, I believe that the G digital euro should address all the population of the euro area the same way, but national authorities should then communicate in a specific way within the national boundaries. Uh, can you pinpoint what is it about the cash that uh, our neighbors from Slovenia love that much? Is it the privacy or some other aspect? It is difficult to say. I should not uh, refer here to the shadow economy, which is also an important uh, role of cash uh, 
because it is used for uh, shared economy to avoid paying taxes and so on. But people are just used to I, I cannot uh, go for it. Uh, the ECB has performed uh, a survey on the payment habits, mm -hmm. and uh, the results of this uh, survey are that, uh, especially people uh, older than 65, they are very attached to cash. While the youngsters, they use cash only when other possibilities are not available. Mm. And it's quite often, it happens to me uh, that I go to the restaurant and it's not possible to, ca to pay with a cashless uh, means of payment. But the restaurant keeper, the owner, he or she exactly knows where the closest ATM is. Mm -hmm. And I have to pay then 12 euros uh, for visa withdrawal with a credit card. And that's annoying for me. That's annoying because I prefer carrying only my smartphone with me and paying at the moment with Apple Pay in the future, of course, with the digital euro. Thank you very much. Uh, now the question for Mr. Mr. Grimm, uh, head of FinTech uh, from uh, the Central Bank of Finland. So your country is somewhere on the opposite side <laughs> when it comes to cash payments uh, than, than Slovenia. So uh, first of all, how uh, are you personally involved in Digital Europe project and uh, what are the sentiments uh, in Finland towards the project? Yes, thank you for the question and it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, so we started looking into this topic, I would say about eight years ago, 2015, 2016, and that's when we set up a new function in the, in the central bank. Um, which is the division that I'm heading now, and it's within the payments department. So in the payments department, we have our payment systems and oversight, and then we also have cash. Mm -hmm. We kind of set up fintech in between those. So it both looks at the development of payment systems, but also the future of money itself. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting position, and we've had this function now for about eight years. Um, so we've been involved in CBDC and digital euro discussions from the very beginning, as soon as they started, we, we, we got involved in those discussions and were part of the different um, work streams of that particular project. I myself am on the project steering group, and then we have a team that's supporting myself and our um, uh, high-level task force members and uh, other, other members who are on, the, on that team. And it's true, Finland is maybe an example of a very highly digitized economy, if not possibly, depending on metric, maybe the, the most digitized in the euro system in some sense. So just to give context, we have the latest figures we have is about 7% of the population use cash. So the rest, about 90, 95% depend on, on card payments, but, but also digital payments in general. And basically everything in our society is, is digitized, healthcare, travel, public services, everything. And we have a very advanced um, identification system, which, which kind of underpins that. So it's uh, possible to do very reliable identification of, of people. Um, that's very, really a necessity for, for all these digital services. But I think the good news is that even our country, our central bank and our citizens love cash. Even, even though we, we don't use it much, we, we don't want to get rid of it. So if about 10 years ago it looked like the, the trend was emerging that cash is declining. And some people made the extrapolation that, okay, maybe it will disappear entirely. But that's not actually what we're seeing. So it did decline, but it's now kind of stable at a very low level. And the last couple of polls that we've done, it's not really changing much. So there's a there's sort of small hardcore user group that still uses cash. And a lot of people want to have that option available also in the future. Um, so you can digitize the economy and you can digitize financial services to a very, very large extent, but there are some fundamentals that always have to be there. In, that's at least my view. And one is cash. The other is voting, but let's not talk about that today. <laughs> okay, Good. great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tamara, now we have heard the central bankers and uh, as uh, uh, far as we, we, uh, we can uh, understand, uh, the central bankers not only work on the Digital Euro project, they uh, support it wholeheartedly, irrespective of uh, the countries they come from. 
And what about uh, the bankers, the commercial bankers? You represent uh, them here. So uh, have they already put a Digital Euro project on their radars or is it still too far away? And what are the sentiments of uh, the, the bankers in Croatia towards Digital Euro? Uh, thank you very much for the invitation on the panel. Um, the only one with exclusion of Mrs. Varese uh, that is not from a central bank and uh, I have a different opinion mm. and feelings about uh, digital euro. Uh, with regard to digital euro on the European level, it's already on the radar for a long time. So I'm also a member of the executive committee of European Banking Federation and we are discussing their digital euro a lot. On the Croatian level, uh, we started to discuss uh, the topic of digital euro. We formed a working group within the Croatian Banking Association uh, that's already st that started with its work and we started to learn about the digital euro. And I have to admit that uh, uh, here we have a support of Croatian National Bank and thank you for that. We already had an education uh, for a commercial bank uh, in organization of Croatian Central Bank and I think that this is a good way how to how to introduce something new on the market. I think that we need to discuss and uh, we need to listen to each other because I see that on the European level, within the European Banking Federation, there are a lot of hesitations with regard to digital euro project. Uh, a lot of open questions. Uh, I don't have a feeling that... Uh, there have been a lot of discussion on the European level because they see that the commercial banks are still very hesitant about uh, euro. To put it mildly, not happy about the digital euro uh, with a lot of objections, with a lot of very worrying scenario analysis what digital euro will bring to commercial banking sector. So I think that there is a need really to discuss more and to be transparent and to try to solve the issues uh, when the project is in the early phase. What we have discussed on the European Banking Federation level is that we are fearing the scenario where uh, this will go uh, very far and that at a certain point, uh, the people will say, well, we already invested a lot of people, a lot of money in the project. It's already expensive project and we cannot go back right now. So this is, this is the scenario that we fear. So you fear that you would uh, invest a lot of money, but at the end, uh, the pro project will fail and uh, the no, we money fear, invested will no, be no, no, no. in vain. We fear that central banks will invest a lot of time and money, okay. and then they will impose the digital euro project to commercial banks, and they will say, oh, okay, this is it. You have to fit in. Without asking commercial banks, what do you think? Which are the main issues? Uh, like, how can I, we solve the main issues? So, okay. yeah. Because it's very interesting. But uh, before that, I would like uh, to, uh, to hear the, the voice of academia. So could you please tell us, uh, so from which angle are you looking at the, the digital euro and uh, what are your views about it? First of all, thank you for your invitation. And uh, I am very happy to say that uh, our the research unit at the University of Florence starts since the beginning of monitoring the development of a central bank digital currency around the world. So we uh, thought that there was something that uh, we should check and monitor mm -hmm. closely because definitely we bring many change if it would be implemented, that's how we said. And uh, our research uh, at the beginning uh, was uh, trying to uh, develop uh, a system and then we call a universal access device that was able to have in the same um, hardware both the uh, identity uh, features than the um, a means of payment. Mm -hmm. And this tool uh, get rid of the um, other uh, element that comes from 
not European uh, company. So our idea was very uh, focused on the sovereignty of the Europe. So we, that was our first project, mm -hmm. and we published that since, uh, and that was in 2020. And we uh, also, after that, we continue our research and we engage with the academia around the world and um, exploring not only the central bank digital currency, but the digital asset in general. So a broad uh, analysis and that uh, at the end, uh, we, at the end of this project, we published just last month a book. And, uh, and for us, it's a starting point. The book is a starting point in the sense that it's something that we really need to go deeply and work. I think the academia should be also be listened from the European Central Bank in the sense that we definitely we have other interpretation. Some interpretation are the same, other have a different angle. But definitely, we think that is something that we have to pursue. Okay. So, great. Uh, so, we have heard a little bit different uh, 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 viewpoints on Digital Euro. So, I would let uh, now Mr. Whitlock maybe to comment on uh, the voice of uh, Croatian Bankers Association. So, uh, did you already take the, the commercial banks on board and have you, do you listen to them or communicate with them regularly? So, yes. So, um, so I, I am a bit disappointed that you say that we do, don't talk, uh, uh, to the banks. We talk to all stakeholders. So we had in the investigation phase, we had a market advisory group where the majority of the uh, participants were experts from the financial sector. They were there on their own terms. But we have also in the whole of the uh, investigation phase, I think on a, roughly on a monthly basis, interacted with the European Retail Payments Board, where we have all the stakeholders, both merchants, consumers, as banks, as non-banks, PSPs. All the design decisions have been discussed there. We uh, allowed them uh, uh, for feedback. We also had bilateral interchanges to understand the feedback. And we had a, a feedback session uh, after that. This is all published on the, on the website. Um, and we are continuing with that uh, 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 setup also uh, in this phase. In the rulebook development group, as I just mentioned, which is about standards, the banks are also very well represented. Uh, they are currently reviewing the work that they have done together with us, uh, with all the stakeholders last year. So um, there is a lot of interaction. Um, there is also uh, um, so so we I, I think we invest a lot in the interaction, uh, and we also uh, 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 listen and we are transparent. That's not to say that we have completely. Uh, uh, found solutions to everything, and I don't want to take that away. But I, I, I want to take away the, the idea that we would do something that's not open and transparent. And in parallel, the legislative uh, discussion is ongoing, of uh, on which uh, I know the banks are also uh, heavily informed. So on a European level, what we get back is that the banks say we, we, what they say is we support the digital euro. We understand it's important. But we have concerns, uh, and uh, concerns uh, um, are, I think, roughly in two areas. So one is about the impact on the liquidity, uh, and that's one point, uh, and on the holding limits. Uh, so to say there is, is that we have already in included in the design quite a number of features in order to... Uh, to address that concern, because we also want financial stability. It's in our mandate, so we are uh, committed to that as well. So those are the points that were on the slides, like no remuneration, that there would be a holding limit, that there's this reverse waterfall. Um, so that that is on one side. Uh, and then on the other side, there's the concern about uh, the fit in the ecosystem, as I call it. So how would this work together with private uh, uh, solutions? Also there, as I try to explain, we think there's really a benefit and, and they can strengthen each other instead of compete with each other. On both, we need to further discuss. Um, so uh, on, the, on the holding limit in the preparation phase, we have a, a work planned to do um, 
the modeling. So what would be the models that we would develop that at a certain point in time uh, we could establish the, the holding limit uh, and that we really want to do also in uh, close cooperation with uh, market participants. So for also via the European Retail Payments Board, we will uh, uh, have this on the agenda from, our, from, from April. So I indeed think where there is more work to do, but I truly believe that the digital euro is extremely important for Europe. Uh, but also really brings benefits not only for the consumers and the merchants, which is important as, as, as itself, but I think also for the banking sector. So I do trust that with further exchanges, we will uh, uh, find a digital euro uh, that also the, the banking associations would be very happy to distribute. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for that answer. And uh, I think that uh, the... Uh, the reason for organizing such panels is not only to express our views and send it, uh, send them to the audience and to uh, a general public, but also to establish relationships uh, among ourselves and to build uh, a trust and to uh, maybe to to, to uh, find the, the points where we disagree, but also the ways how to communicate about them. Uh, but uh, I will still uh, uh, dwell with, with you a little bit and ask you about uh, the counterfactual. So uh, we see from everything that you have said that the, the, the Digital Europe project is well on the way and uh, it will uh, well uh, 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 result in the uh, implementation of Digital Euro uh, quite soon, not uh, in, in a uh, very uh, short run, but quite soon. But what if not? Uh, how would the European payment uh, landscape look like if we don't introduce digital euro? Before I go to the question, uh, let me be more precise. So there's currently still discussion on the legislation and that will need, first need to finalize before the governing council can mm -hmm. uh, will only consider to decide a digital euro. So there's still before uh, we will be completely sure that there will be a digital euro the legislation first need to be finalized and only then a decision of the governing council. So there's still some step to take before there will really truly be a, a, a digital euro. Um, but in the, the, the counterfactual, I think the, uh, uh, we get a lot of the questions on, okay, but um, what is currently wrong? Uh, but I think we need to look not in the two or three years. This is really about a period of time or five years or 10 years or 20 years from now. Um, and currently, um, uh, we will probably be in a society where and, uh, uh, there will still be cash, but people will live much more in a digitalized world. So in e-commerce, you, you, you can't pay cash, so you need to pay digitally. And also in, uh, in other environments, digital payments will become uh, more dominant. Um, Currently, we have a system where you have cash and you have uh, uh, the payments. So, but... If we would not do anything, then we would live in a world where we have only private companies that would be able to provide payment solutions. Mm. So this means that if you want to pay, you need to put your money at such an institution. And currently we assume this to be our European banks we all uh, love. Um, but we see big techs becoming more and more dominantly. So it's not a given <laughs> Uh, uh, that they uh, that in twenty or thirty years from now uh, uh, that they are the dominant. So maybe the, then we people need to give their money to these players in order to be able to pay. And we believe that being able to pay is a public good, uh, and therefore it's important that you can also pay with central bank money, also in a digital form. Having said that, also. In the, in the current environment, uh, the current dependency of, uh, uh, of non-European schemes um, is extremely high. Uh, and fast forward in 10, 20 years, do we feel comfortable that our payments are really provi uh, provided mm -hmm. not by Europe? There is no jurisdiction that is so dependent for something so crucial for its society uh, um, than we have in Europe. And then last but not least, uh, we have not been able, the banking sector have not been able to deliver a truly Euro one pan-European solution, digital solution. So um, 
fast forward, it's important that it's there. Okay, thank you very much. So for Simon, the next question. So uh, recently you had one conference uh, in Slovenia about the digital euro introduction. So uh, people in Slovenia have already got this message, message that the, the, this project is underway. So uh, can you tell us about the, the impressions and the sentiments after the conference? What kind of feedback uh, did you get? And uh, can you also tell us what will exactly change for the Slovenian uh, people once the digital euro is introduced? Indeed, we have uh, had a large conference in December last year. It was a high-level conference attended by six governors of not only the region, but also from the Baltics. And um, it had uh, a large echo uh, in the media. So people are now familiar that something is going on, but of course they don't understand all the details. Even I would like to relate to the Banking Association of Croatia. When I had first discussions with the supervisory board of the Bank Association of uh, Slovenia a few years ago, they were claiming we already have digital euro. What do you think it is in the account of the uh, consumers uh, with us? It's digital. It's digital euro. And it is difficult to explain the difference between commercial bank money and central bank money. So I believe that communication will be crucial. We should not explain to normal people from the street the difference uh, between central bank money and commercial bank money but we should use the narrative of digital cash. Digital cash with some value-added features and same level of privacy, uh, excellent user experience, and of course, um, it should be adapted to the digital age. So when they hear digital cash, it is something different. It is not a deposit with a commercial bank. And we are going that way. And uh, for this, we also need, um, from the very beginning, it is my own opinion, also the offline version of uh, Digital Euro, because this is a true replication of cash in a digital world. We cannot add offline some at some point later. So this is very important. And to describe the Slovenian landscape a little bit uh, deeper, also relating to the Bank Association of Croatia. Instant payments are very important uh, at the moment. We have uh, that EPC scheme for instant payments now for many years. Uh, also, the Euro system has established tips for pan-European instant payments, and people are getting used to it. So, Digital Euro will be based on the principles of the instant payments. Once people get familiar with instant payments, and instant payments are always linked to a bank account with your commercial bank. So this is an area where commercial banks should see advantage and opportunity because it is not going to some big tax or somewhere. It is linked to your normal current account with a commercial bank. And uh, in Slovenia, we have a very successful national scheme for instant payments. Half a million Slovenians, it is more than... 25% uh, of population have already been using our instant payment application. And this is important to get a user experience, which will be very similar than in the environment of, uh, of um, digital euro. And as many of you may be familiar, the euro system is supporting very much also private initiatives in establishing a pan-European instant payment solutions. We have uh, some uh, activities of the EPI, your payment payments initiative, some uh, mobile operators uh, wanting to achieve interoperability and so on. But it is not uh, taking grounds, uh, at least not in a pan-European context. So I believe that banks should see normal instant payments in digital euro as complementary um, topics or issues and uh, this is also very important for merchants I have I have to say 
Slovenians, Slovenians are only 2 million. In the Euro area, we have 350 million uh, citizens. Uh, and we should, of course, have a unique, harmonized user experience. I cannot pay with Slovenian solution. I have it. I like it abroad. No way. Even customers, Slovenians, customers of N26 or Revolut cannot use it because they cannot uh, access this uh, scheme. So for merchants, it will be very important to have a digital euro because Slovenia is, according to some bank, uh, the France uh, studies, ranked among the highest merchant uh, fee countries in the Europe. We have to know that digital euro will not have its own scheme to be paid, at least not in terms as uh, visa scheme or MC scheme are paid for today. I like to say that if you're looking Champions League in football, there are always some advertisements of one card scheme around the stadium. I doubt that the digital euro will have such uh, uh, panels around the uh, soccer uh, field. I'm not sure. Uh, so it should be cheaper for merchants. And uh, the acquiring banks should not gain some extra profits out of it. It should be cheaper because we will not charge any special scheme fee. And what is important, it is expected, according to the proposal of the Commission, to, be also, to also have a status of legal tender. It is very important. And uh, to conclude this intervention, I believe that banks should seize the opportunity today having instant payments. Offering an application, a solution to customers still trying to achieve pan-European reach. And then digital euro will be just something next to it. It should not crowd out the private instant payment solutions. So um, this is this is my um, opinion, uh, and I believe that banks should not be afraid of it. Uh, just last uh, sentence in this, um, in replying to this question, can you imagine N26 or Revolut being in existence without SEPA? I cannot. And now Digital Euro as a next stage is coming, again offering niche players to get to gain pan-European reach from the day one. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before, before turning back to Tamara and checking whether the opinion has changed, uh, <laughs> uh, let us go to uh, Alexi. So in, in Finland, uh, the society is a little bit different uh, than in, in Slovenia or Croatia, but also the, uh, the economy is different. And uh, in Finland, you have quite developed a digital and fintech uh, landscape. So do you see any role of, of uh, fintech companies in digital euro or uh, any opportunities for them? Yes, every country is different. Um, and that's not to say that Finland is necessarily the most advanced or, or, or perfect. We, we have our challenges as well. Um, so the digitization hasn't um, always resulted in the, in the kind of perfect outcome. Um, so, so one of those is when we see what's happened in the fintech, in the fintech industry, especially smaller companies that have come to the market in recent years, as actually Simon mentioned, uh, there was an idea that they could offer services that compete with banks, that there would be some sort of competition between mm -hmm. uh, payment services and, and services offered by banks. What actually happened is that they are very dependent on banks to offer their services at the moment. It's, it's practically impossible for a fintech company to build services and offer services without building a relationship with a bank to handle customer funds, to do payments. And that would, has happened is a lot of the kind of business benefits um, are not actually going to the fintechs themselves, but it's actually going to banks. So the, the banks becoming even even stronger than, than than before. Even though maybe five, ten years ago, we thought that banks would be disrupted by fintech companies and there would be new competition, but that, that hasn't really happened because the um, 
the infrastructures and the, and the payment landscape doesn't really fully allow that. So what the digital euro is actually doing is precisely that is it's offering a complete, completely different alternative to managing payments. Um, so for a smaller company, um, it should be less costly and less burdensome to build a service around the digital around digital euro accounts because you don't practically actually handle customer money. The money stays mm-hmm. in the central bank, um, so you don't actually have to um, open open a bank account with a commercial bank to do to, uh, safeguarding of customer funds and to do payments. There is an alternative with the digital euro, so you can actually build the services entirely around digital euro accounts, and that makes it um, from the fintech perspective. A kind of more, a kind of a lighter model, so it doesn't require quite as much um, administrative burden, and also business. The business benefits are, are much better because the euro system is not going to charge you any scheme fees or anything like that. So you can basically use that as a sort of open platform to to build services. So that's that's sort of one aspect at least. And then maybe to also comment on um, because we we also our banks have also expressed some concerns, um, and and one point that. Uh, I usually want to point out is that we're, we're talking about um, the growth of uh, the business into the future. So we're not really too much worried about, it's not a zero sum game, but that, I think that's the point. So the di- introduction of the digital euro is not going to suck deposits from banks or money from cash the way it is now. What we have to look at is the growth of money from now into the future and how that is divided between new commercial bank deposits, new cash, and digital euro is going to get some share of that growth. So we're not actually touching, um, there's no, not, not, not necessarily any decline in the current levels of deposits or cash. We're talking about how, how the kind of new economy is going to be divided between these three different forms of money. Because what, when we look back 20 years, uh, that's exactly the same that's happened. So Deposits have grown very much, but cash has also grown very much, and they haven't really competed with each other. They're both grown. So in the future, from now into into the future, that growth is going to be divided between three different forms of money, cash, digital euro, and bank deposits. Uh, can you tell us what is the level of discussion in Finland a bit about digital euro? Uh, is it still a, a new topic or... Uh, um... People talk about it in their uh, well, well, drinking coffee. If you drink coffee in a coffee, it's like us. So I don't know that. <laughs> At you do. It's a topic that um, people who work in the industry know about very well. Mm-hmm. They they follow it. But I, I would say the general public, there has been some news, um, some press coverage of the digital euro. People have noticed it, but um, maybe this, the discussion isn't very lively at the mm. moment and i think that has to do with from the consumers from the citizens point of view we have to be honest there isn't necessarily much novelty yes in introducing the, 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 the digital euro they they've seen what it's about and they think okay that's one more option to all the other services that I, that we already have so from our perspective at the bank of finland we see it maybe a bit more as a kind of infrastructure project a kind of back end project mm-hmm. rather than a front end project Uh, so for us, the fact that it brings resilience, brings an alternative payment rail, and it brings more competition, those are maybe the key arguments for us. And we, we're not even trying to convince the public that they are going, getting some kind of completely novel mm. product. I see. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Barezi, so uh, from your point of view, what would be the economic but also uh, social uh, impacts of digital euro? Uh, I think that this this uh, social part is uh, very important as well, not only the economic, so it's yeah. social and or societal. First of all, I would like to add something for my previous uh, uh, speakers, and I agree 100% percent to what they said. And first, I want to say about the instant payment. Instant payment uh, from the perspective of the central bank, we we can, with the digital euro, we can have a st- an instant finality of payment. So this is crucial. This is very important. And it's something that is a risk-free payment because it's the liability of the central bank. This is something that the people have to be educated to understand. So this is something that could be a social point of view. 
And I would like to add what I said in my previous uh, speaker about the importance of payment service providers. They are not in contrast. The, the way of working should be in harmonizing with the, the, the central banks. So because we have a regulation, we have a, a, the directive, the new proposal for the digital euro mentioned the second payment service directive. And of course, this is something that they, the bank has to implement. But we also have now the proposal for the third payment service directive. So we have to take in consideration that the, the way of act of the payment service providers is not opposite of what the, the central bank does. So we need to have a cooperation. That is the idea of the academia. And we, if we are able to build something together, I think that the result could be much, much more valuable. That is, uh, of, of course, our um, point of view. And you are asking about the, the social uh, so social uh, elements. There we we are thinking about the privacy. We are getting like uh, Miss Evelyn said. Uh, we are thinking about also the the fraud. This is something that has to be the consumer. The, the, con, the consumer has to be protected. And um, of course. We can also think about the uh, inclusion, but the inclusion goes with the uh, financial education, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, at least for Italy, we, uh, we don't have uh, so much uh, um, answer on this side. And we don't have a, a, a really educated people that understand what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, if they they make a confusion, if they ask about the digital asset, they they think Bitcoin. <sighs> so they confuse the digital euro with the with the cryptocurrency. For so if you don't uh, you are not in a, an educated uh, um, uh, consist, you you have this kind of uh, uh, answer back. So this is something that we think. We should start from the school, from the very beginning, uh, try to express what is the difference. What does it mean to have a new kind of, of digital form of euro? And uh, on the same time, so we can say that unfortunately, uh, we have uh, unbanked and we have also underbanked. So the digital euro could be useful also to help the micro imprenditory um, activities and of course the I'm not talking about Italy but uh, women are really the most unbanked people mm -hmm. in Italy and uh, this is something that should should be changed and mm -hmm. and I think that the, this could be uh, really a mean of uh, inclusion and um, as we said with the light that you show us there is some kind of of a public authority that is designated to help people that are not able to do by themselves this kind of uh, boarding in the account of to the um, that held the digital euro. So this is something that we should really work on. So do you have any advice for us uh, central bankers uh, on uh, how exactly to promote the financial literacy? in order to make a digital euro more easily uh, adopted by, by the people? I think that the best thing is starting with the school, just from the beginning in an easy way. And also all the media can help us. And uh, in academia, we try to uh, give, of course, the specific uh, I can say explanation, but it's something that is a more higher level on people that they take some kind of course and the specific on this uh, on digital assets in general and the central bank digital currency in specific. But uh, the problem is that it's not that they educated people. The problem is the people that has no clue what it is uh, because it has not a financial background, but a financial, I think, not the, the, the level of uh, investor on the trademark. I 
that's why I think is something it's that we really, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a really hot topic. <laughs> Thank you. Tamara. Uh, so you said that uh, the banks see some challenges or risks with uh, the introduction of digital euro, but uh, do they see any opportunities uh, with the digital euro? First, yeah, I will refer to, to what was said. Uh, right. On right. The panel. Uh, so Ms. Valeri said one key word for me, and it's cooperation. Mm. I think that for the successful implementation of the project, we all need to cooperate. It's from academia, central bankers, commercial bankers, uh, consumers. So cooperation, I think it's, it's a key word here. Uh, the other things other that you mentioned, which I think it, it's of key importance that we see the, the real person behind the project. <laughs> Uh, and that's that's one of the really uh, important things. The other things that Simon mentioned uh, were payment services. With regard to payment services, uh, when we had this uh, introductory education uh, with Croatia Central Bank, then I would say the 90% of the questions were with regard to payment services. What then? What if uh, there are still, as I understood from this from this meeting, still a lot, a lot of open questions. And uh, I believe that when we are talking about digital euro, we have to talk also about the open issues. Your presentation was great, but I was missing, okay, still open issues that we'll still need to, to handle. And I think that here is here is the, the key, that we, that the flow of information is really good. And then when the flow on the, of information will be good, then we will have less open issues, less fear, because when something is not familiar, then yeah, then you are hesitant to accept it. When it is familiar, when you you are getting the answer to your question, you are getting reassured. So it's like like the kid with the parent. If the parents will give you a lot of information, then okay, you will accept it. it. It's a different situation from when the parent says you have to do it. You're not very happy when someone says you have to do it. So it's it's really uh, we have to 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 start from this point. So the flow of information, and I think that really this is a great thing that we're discussing here this today that you came here. That we see the person who is behind the project, that you are explaining things, and that, that's crucial. Thank you very much uh, for that. With regard to challenges, uh, there are a lot of them. No. But you also I'm said, you know, well, yeah, opportunity. Opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let, we don't see a lot of opportunities for the time being. To be quite honest. <laughs> to be quite honest. Uh, yes. Okay. There is a. Uh, better opportunity in, in payment system and to, in cooperation with fintech. I'm sure that there will be a lot of innovation uh, that will be implemented in the banking sector and this is where we see the pluses uh, of the project. And for the time being, I'm, I'm afraid that I have to stop here because we okay. currently don't see a lot of pluses, but I'm sure that with yeah. time, we will see it even more. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, but I can tell you, you, you said that the, there are gaps to be filled. Uh, there are certain points that uh, have to be further discussed. But uh, I remember when talking about digital euro one year ago or two years ago, we had the, the gaps were much, much bigger than now. And I'm very happy with... Uh, this is normal process. Yeah. Whichever project we, we talk about, yeah. it's yeah. always at the beginning that we have a lot of gaps. Mm. And then after some time that these gaps are mm. filled and everything goes smoothly. So I believe that this is also one of the projects that we'll have at the end mm. that will be a successful project uh, and that we will all be satisfied with the project. Thank you. So, Ms. Whitbox, I, I know that uh, the issue of, on one hand, privacy, on the other hand, security was very important while designing the, the digital euro. So, uh, what what uh, uh, kind of solutions, uh, with what kind of solutions did you come up when it comes to privacy and security? Well, they, they are... Uh, uh, 
both important, I, I would say. And then, uh, so on privacy, as we, as we said before, so let me first of all say for the end to end privacy uh, and privacy in general, the co legislator is in, in the end very important. Uh, so let's be uh, the, the draft legislation that is there and uh, the requirements they put to pr uh, privacy uh are determining and 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 the starting point uh, for for the digital euro so uh, let me start there um and there with with privacy there is the this balance between on one side the right th uh, to privacy that uh, everybody has and on the other hand uh, uh the wish for for society to uh, to avoid anti money laundering or terrorist financing so uh, which you can't do if you don't uh, know anything. So that's why the legislator has said, let's make sure that the banks can uh, see the data. But by that, uh, as we said, we design uh, the backend of the digital euro, so the part that the euro system will see in a way that we cannot connect any transaction to a private individual. Um, as I said, which is not common in, in current solutions, but we will design it in this way so we, we cannot uh, uh, do this. And next to that, we have this offline digital euro, which provides even a, a higher level of privacy because the transactions don't flow through any system because they stay between two devices. So with these two uh, uh, options, we believe that the digital euro provides really a, a, a a much higher level of privacy uh, than it's uh, uh, currently in any payment uh, solution. Um, and then, of course, security. Um, uh, there is more uh, that is more about uh, cybersecurity and really building the system. So part of the what I told you before, we're doing now or restarting actually with the sourcing, so the procurement of the backend uh, systems and their cybersecurity is extremely important. Uh, to, di to design a, a system uh, that would be very resilient. And then last but not least, um, uh, fraud was mentioned uh, before. Uh, unfortunately, there are always fraudsters uh, and they are always one step ahead, it seems, uh, which is true with cash. Uh, it's also true uh, with digital means of payments. So for that, uh, um, we, we would provide, on top of what the banks would do themselves, uh, uh, another layer because a bank can only see the transactions that their clients are doing uh, but then the transactions flow through for the system so we can uh, 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 detect some uh, additional uh, uh, information which we give back to the banks and then it's up to the banks so we don't know any personal data but we just know something that is suspicious the suspicious transaction we give it to the bank to, uh, to investigate so it's an ad additional source of information to make it as resilient against fraud as possible. But as mentioned on in, in general, I think uh, uh, education um, for on digital means of payment in general, uh, but also for the digital euro will be crucial also to make sure that people uh, uh, are not uh, tricked uh, so that we can add. So that's an important part. Uh, will be an important part if we would later uh, roll out in the educational part uh, to make sure that people are well informed there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Professor Baresi, uh, your background is in law, as far as I know. And Ms. Whitlocks has uh, mentioned that uh, the legal part is still, uh, well, the work in progress, we can say. So, do you see some legal considerations when it comes to uh, the implementation of digital Europe? Yeah, and I would like to really link to the fraud that mm. she because we have in the proposal of the digital euro uh, a fraud detection and prevention mechanism, mm. and on this specific uh, issue, uh, there was an opinion of the European Central Bank that was issued after the proposal regulation, the EBA clearing, and the European Data Protection Board and supervision they make an uh, interpretation and amendment mm. to this uh, uh, proposal regulation. This is uh, very important. So we, we go again with the word uh, that uh, uh, we underlined before, cooperation. So it's uh, very important, according to academia, according to our opinion, to have a, a different interpretation and understand what is the better way to proceed. So in these specific things, this is crucial, fraud and the detention mechanism. According to the 
central bank digital, uh, called the central bank, this kind of mechanism is very important for the digital euro. And, uh, but uh, according to the ECB, it's something that would be central and decide and uh, managed by the ECB. Um, the amendment that was done at the ECB at the, the national central, the other national central bank. So this is something that is different from the proposal. And the um, opposite idea is the EBA clearing. EBA clearing says, no, 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 we don't need this kind of mechanism. We is is going to be a competition, mm-hmm. and the European Central Bank in this way is going to have a, a privileged position. So it's absolutely against, and they propose to take it out the Article 32 and the rest of 68 of the proposal regulation on the digital euro. On the other side, we have uh, uh, something in the middle, so the European Data Protection Board, the European Data Protection Regulation, that says well, we can have this kind of mechanism as long as there is the privacy protection and the pr- principle of proportionality is respect. So at the end, uh, we have uh, these three different uh, interpretation and the amendment that was done to the proposal regulation on the digital euro and the, the colleges later have to take a really in consideration when they are going to issue the definite the, the definitely version of the, the digital euro proposal yeah, yeah that's the first one I, I just uh, want to say something so on, on this so the only thing what we have said so far we find it important that there is this uh, 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 fraud detection, which is on top what each bank can do separately. Whether this is within the uh, central bank or sourced externally is actually part of uh, of uh, of the decisions st- still to be taken. It is also, as you might have seen in the call for offers, we have asked for external providers for fraud and risk uh, solutions. And also on the on the implementation uh, when, on the EDPA, this is of course something that we take in consideration. So also there, uh, we look to a fraud solution where we don't, uh, we have seen or we know that you can have this fraud detection without knowing who are the private individuals. So the privacy and fraud is a very important one. And so we take all these comments very seriously uh, and... Uh, w- 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 we're not exactly on the point that you stated at the beginning, so I just want to to phrase this. Thank you. Uh, an additional uh, question for Mr. Grimm. Uh, so, uh, in what opinion, uh, how would the coexistence uh, of digital euro on one hand and stable coins on the other hand look like? And is there even a room for digital euro? Or is it already too crowded? <laughs> on that market? Yeah, that's a good question. So our job is really to kind of look at how people pay in the future. That That's really the, the job of our division um, and to look at all the possible alternatives. And so, mm-hmm. so far we've been discussing bank deposits, which, which of course is, is a maybe the biggest um, you know, means of payment for us today, cash, digital euro, card payments, and so on. And then there might be some other potential new entrance into the payments market. And stable coins is one which has been discussed. Um, so if we look at it from, if we analyze it from a technical point of view, uh, can it perform the kinds of payments that we, you know, that all these other payment methods do? And the answer is yes. So technically it, it could do that. People could pay each other using stable coins that they could basically go to a shop and pay with stable coins. And then what we do is we look at the actual, the actual data. We, we collect statistics and we see, look at people, how people behave, consumer behavior, business behavior, and so on. And we don't see anyone using stable coins for payments. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's an, that's an interesting dilemma. So on the one hand, you have these stable coin companies which kind of advertise themselves as being payment methods. And then we also see them growing in size so that the kind of the, how many stable coins are, are out in circulation what we don't see is them actually being used by people, everyday people in everyday payments. So they must be used somewhere else. And that somewhere else is probably crypto trading ex- on exchanges. Um, so potentially they could move out of those crypto trading uh, facilities to other places where payments are being made. 
but currently we're simply not seeing that. So that's just an observation that we, we currently have is that that doesn't seem to be happening. So we have to keep an eye on that. But so far, the data is quite sort of low in that respect. Great. Thank you. Um, and yeah, yeah, maybe it's already. Uh, it's about time. Uh, great, great. That uh, it was agreed before the fair. <laughs> <laughs> no surprises. So I uh, wanted to ask uh, all of you from the audience whether you have some questions. Of course, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, and, uh, well, ask uh, one or more of the panelists. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Nikolaj Koric from uh, Money Motion Conference. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, uh, Mrs. Whitlux uh, maybe if she could elaborate a bit more on fraud prevention and offline transactions. Because uh, from what I understood from Mr. Anko, from his description, those would be uh, completely uh, anonymous and uh, rooted um, outside of the clearing system, of the centralized clearing system. Now, we already have such a payment uh, network. It's basically uh, anonymous uh, cryptocurrencies uh, like Monero. And those are, those are effectively outlawed in the European Union because any company that handles them cannot have a bank account that has some serious uh, issues with the regulator. So uh, we already have such su such experiences. It's really hard to do fraud prevention, uh, uh, prevention of uh, financing, uh, financing of terrorism and and money laundering on the completely anonymous payment networks that that do not are not cle centrally cleared. So how uh, what are the ideas how to solve this problem? Well, let me let me start with that the the draft legislation excludes full anonymity. So that means that if you want to get hold of a digital euro, you need to go to a, a, a payment service provider, they need to KYC you, and then they get give you access to a digital euro, and then you can fund it and you have digital euro. So uh, th there would be no, if this would be adopted, there would be no anonymous digital euro uh, transaction. So that's to start with. And then, of course, it can change. Uh, the legislator could say we allow for a non uh, technically it could you could make, uh, especially on offline, you can make a say a prepaid card where you op off top of fifty euros and then you can pay. Technically, it can, but the legislator says we find it important uh, this balance between privacy uh, on the one hand and uh, uh, um, fighting uh, anti money laundering CFT on the other hand. So that means that you always need to be KYC'd. And then, um, let me stick first with online. Then the bank, the, the transactions would go through the bank and they would do similar transaction monitoring as they currently do for any other digital European payment means. And they also will drive this through their fraud pretension and then they can do uh, their own thing. Then it would go to the euro system to be settled. And there we propose that it will be, say, pseudonymized so that we don't know, we only see a transaction where we don't know uh, who is this uh, this person. So that is the difference uh, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the two layers. Uh, and for offline, the transaction would not go on a network because, as I explained, it would be more like cash. Uh, so only when you defund it, you want mm. to put it back, uh, then there is an interaction with the systems, but the other one are uh, not. So there is a different level of privacy between the two uh, uh, solutions but in all occasions the digital the euro system would not be able to connect a transaction to a private individual thanks a lot please mm -hmm. oh. Cos Cosmin Cosma from uh, Romanian FinTech Association uh, I want to congratulate the National Bank of Croatia for this very very interesting and strategic subject to be taken here uh, I want uh, also to add something uh, a, a new uh, a new uh, point of view and it is my son who is eight years old he doesn't work with money in banks but he has roblox coins so he already pays with roblox coins so this is the uh, this is the reason why i cannot see a future of euro without digital currency so i cannot see a uh, 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 euro being as a coin without a digital version of it uh, which is uh, uh, which is uh, obvious, and this is also an opportunity for the banks because if the banks wants Bogdan to be their customer, at some point they need to come into the boat as soon as possible. Otherwise, Bogdan will trade Roblox coins on some other wallets. 
And now, right now, the question, the question is, because I'm a little bit puzzled still, uh, um, uh, Mrs. with blocks. And the question, previous question is also, I can understand uh, the offline version of digital coin, of digital euro, because it will be anonymity, like the cash right now, like uh, the, the, the euro, the, the new digital cash, like Mr. Uh, Mr. Anko said. But it's hard for me to understand the jeopardization of the digital euro within the uh, banking ecosystem on the instant payments open banking. I'm a founder of a TPP in open banking. So if you're saying to me that you are launching right now a digital euro that will uh, down, uh, get down to zero all my ten, eight years uh, 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 development of my fintech, then it is something that I need to be aware uh, so what is right now the exact, uh, let's say, uh, the intersection point between PSD2, PSD3 and Digital Euro uh, project? So maybe um, on, on the last point. Um, so first of all, we believe that the Digital Euro would be an addition to the landscape that is currently there. So that means that there remain private payment solution with commercial bank money. Uh, so you put your money at the bank and then you want to pay. Uh, and then uh, we, there are a number of different solutions. So there are the card solutions, for example, that are there. But now there is also instant payments. And then uh, on top of that, you could build a retail payments solution. But in order to do so, you need to add a bit of standardization of the front end. Uh, so you need to, to make sure that, uh, so the instant payments run, but you need to do a... It's basically like, uh, yeah. are the standardized uh, layer on which we can create, you know, you know? You can, you can do that. You can do that. Yeah, uh, that's great. <laughs> uh, and we, we stimulate that. Uh, so, and then we, we mentioned EPI as an initiative. We know in Bizum, uh, in, in Spain, that has built on top of that. But in order that everybody can use it, you need to make sure that your standard is accepted or implemented at, with all merchants across Europe. Because otherwise, somebody that wants to pay, the merchant needs to accept it. And that's actually still lacking in the whole in instant payments environment. So the digital euro would build the the standard, a standard. It will be implemented if everything goes on. And then what we say, it's an open standard which could be reused. Actually, we think it will help instant payment-based solutions, including those by the TPPs, because they don't need to convince a merchant to implement their standard because that standard's already there. And let's be honest, if I talk about standard, it's a QR code or a, a, an alias, which is non-competitive. I mean, it's not that somebody says, oh, my QR code is more beautiful than the other QR code. I mean, nobody cares, but it's about the value of the transactions. So on that side, we believe the digital euro would actually enable the instant payments more with all the players there. Um, the other point is, is that on TPPs working on the platform, it could also work on the platform for digital euro. So there you would have a platform that's, that's uh, across uh, the whole of Europe. Uh, and you as a TPP could also build and innovate as you do on instant payments. And since it's both, as we said before, it's an instant settlement, the logic is the same, only the, 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 the coin that you transport is differently. Thank you. We can take it over. It's a bit of technical. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. I've seen uh, many more hands raised. So who was the first? Yeah, please. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to the uh, Croatian National Bank for, uh, for, for having us and, and having this discussion. Uh, I wanted to address um, a point that, uh, that uh, Tamara mentioned uh, about uh, really bringing this into the open and, and meeting the people who are involved in the digital euro uh, and uh, this, this idea that, well, is, has this project been undertaken very quickly in the dark? And is that actually an issue? Uh, and on the other hand, one might say that, uh, that maybe it needs to be done uh, in the dark to protect, to protect us from uh, lobbying efforts by incumbent business models as well. So I think there's a, there's a tension here that's really interesting. And, and I'd like to ask you to explore this tension a bit. But in the context of what, what I think are two big elephants in the room, one of them is the 
the uh, the instant payments, uh, which follows up on Cosman's point, um, which is that maybe uh, if we do we do we see this as an op- as a responsibility of uh, of the the, uh, the ECB to facilitate some kind of instant settlement mechanism in the digital world, a digital cash that does that. That's question. That's one of these contexts. That's one question in this context. And the other aspect is, um, in the context of privacy, it seems like we're talking about Monero, as uh, as uh, it was just mentioned, as, as one extreme, completely in the dark, no regulation at all. But on the other hand, no one mentioned the Financial Action Task Force travel rule, which seems to be the you know, a big elephant in this room, which is the other extreme. Everything is completely transparent and all the transparency is just determined ex post by whoever is in power. <laughs> um, so have you considered that there are projects like BIS Project Torbion by the BIS Swiss Center uh, that actually have one party who is anonymous and one party who is not uh, and other kinds of approaches like this to this problem? Thanks. Thank you. I think that all the questions are for you. <laughs> Sorry for that. I need to recollect what was the first question again. I'm very yeah, sure. So the, the first one is the instant settlement responsibility. Yeah, but uh, I'm a bit puzzled there. So there is the the, the ECB already has a, 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 a system which is called TIP, so uh, where instant settlement can take place, uh, and which is uh, um, so that that's already there. Uh, and as we say, we. Um, yeah, we are committed to that. So I, I, I don't fully understand. And then, of course, there is the settlement of digital euro, which will also be an instant settlement. But it's different things that you settle because in one you settle uh, central bank money, digital euro, and in the other you settle uh, a commercial bank money. Actually, in that context, I mean the re- reliance of merchants on uh, on credit provision from from the, their their networks and these card payment networks. Is this actually a problem that you see? Merchants that get credit from card schemes? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 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 sorry, I don't understand the question. We should take it off. Uh, we will have a break, so you, you can... Uh, uh, sorry, I don't know the <laughs> for the fully to support a part of one. Sanya. Uh, Sanya had the one question. Thank you. Um, Sanya Tomic is from the Croatian National Bank. Uh, well, uh, actually, I'm also going to address the question to Ms. Whitlocks, unfortunately, not the other panelists, but uh, all the panelists today are talking about the Digital Euro project and having in mind and talking about the retail Rate. Digital Euro. Uh, and uh, I can, um, let's say, completely understand the narrative uh, behind uh, uh, Digital Euro and uh, especially coming from the international and European relations area. Uh, Within this time uh, of the you know, rising geopolitical fragmentation, uh, the uh, uh, strategic autonomy argument seems to me very appealing, and you know to have a solution that will work, uh, even if the other solutions or infrastructures fail, uh, is very important. So uh, I definitely uh, can subscribe uh, to uh, uh, this way of payment. But on the other hand, uh, you know, I think that uh, in a steady state, I'd say. Uh, situation, uh, the wholesale uh, digital era uh, might be even more important, especially since it can also boost some other uh, European European Union projects like the Capital Markets Union, for instance, and not to mention that it could also strengthen the international uh, uh, role of the euro. So uh, can you maybe uh, also uh, tell us something about how we stand with the wholesale digital euro project? Yeah, well, uh, we what we say we already have a digital uh, uh, wholesale CBDC. I mean, it's target. Everything is there's nothing uh, tangible. Uh, there's no cash uh, there. I mean, so in our view uh, on wholesale, uh, we already have a digital wholesale uh, central uh, bank digital currency. Having said that, um, what uh, currently the central bank is doing, or at the ECB level, but with the cooperation of a lot of uh, national central banks is to explore new technology. So uh, whether DLT solutions could uh, uh, add added value for certain use cases in different constructions are currently uh, being explored together with market participants. So we are looking into that uh, as well in parallel. Yeah. Settling transactions on the DLT, yes, yeah. with the whole yes. solution. Thank you. 
Adrian. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, my name is Adrian Podoc. I'm from the Croatian National Bank. A uh, question for Ms. Whitlocks uh, as well. So uh, my question is regarding the potential architecture of the digital euro. So it's pretty clear that uh, it won't be a DLT due to AML uh, restrictions. So uh, not to say that uh, DLTs won't be interoperable with uh, the G digital euro via bridge mechanisms. But my question is, uh, we already have tips and we mentioned it a couple of times today. So will the digital euro build on tips? Will it use tips as a base and et cetera? Thank you. So, so uh, actually, we have not said uh, what would be the technology. So we're currently doing the sourcing uh, where we would be open for providers to uh, uh, to offer their technical solutions. So we have not taken a decision. But what we have said is that we uh, we think that it's important that the settlement would be centralized because it's the ledger of the ECB. And with DLT, you would outsource your ledger. Well, there's not a lot of banks that would do that. So in that sense, we would not do a decentralized setup. And then within that, there could be different technology being explored. So a more account-based like the one that TIPS is built on. But you might know that in the prototyping, we experimented also with UTXO. So we will see the outcome of the uh, discussions with, uh, with the provider and uh, the solution they will provide what would be the final technology choice. But indeed, in the end, whatever the choice is, there could always be interoperability with DOT systems. Yeah. So we have other panelists as well. So maybe some <laughs> a question for. Okay, please. Um, hello, my name is Nadim Sisuno. I'm part of Mento Labs, which is a stablecoin infrastructure builder. And I have one question because, like, one of the things that we are um, struggling is good reserve collateral for the stable coins. So usually we are collateralizing the stable coins. And my question would be, if you ever considered um, a scenario where the European digital coin could be reserve collateral for stable coin projects? <laughs> well, it is, it's not really my area to, to, to give an answer to, to this, but... Uh... Uh, the access to uh, to, the, to the central bank uh, uh, deposit, so to target, has been uh, currently uh, been uh, discussed and been opened up. Uh, so in that context, there might be new opportunities. Thank you. I think that we have more or less exhausted the time of this panel. And uh, thank, uh, thank you uh, for listening carefully, for asking questions. And I think that all of us deserve the round of applause. Thank you, the ballet. Thank you. So uh, we continue at 12.30. You will have some refreshments here. From every two, we will have an introductory presentation before the second panel. It will be Ms. Mr. Jeffrey Goodell about the retail payments in the central banking. And then we will have a more general panel, panel on CBDC. Jeez, maybe we will also touch upon this topic that not CM mentioned about the reserves when backing of stable coins. We will be a little bit more general, not only in particular to the Digital Euro project. So please stay and uh, you will have even more opportunity to ask questions and to join the debate. This is how we uh, at least you know make this second part. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming back to hear the second part of this today's uh, session. It is uh, now the central bank digital currency, uh, well, the more general part, let's say. The first one was really specificities of the Digital Euro project and, uh, well, the basic elements. Now we'll hear a little bit more about the central bank digital currency projects around the world and the motives and uh, some other elements. First, we will start with the introductory presentation which will be held by Mr. Jeffrey Goodell. The name of his presentation is 
the role of central banks in retail payments. But you will hear a bit, bit more, and uh, I'm looking forward to his presentation. Mr. Goodall, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Leonardo, and uh, thank you to um, um, and thank you to uh, Sandra and uh, and uh, everyone at the uh, at the Croatian National Bank for uh, for having me. It's really an honor and a privilege to uh, to be here. Uh, so. So I think I can control this this way, right? Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the role of central banks in, uh, in retail payments, and, uh, and I'm going to go through this rather quickly. I, I know that um, I, I had, had given a talk at the, um, at the uh, Banca, Banca d'Italia a few months ago that had some elements of this, and I wanted to, uh, uh, and, I was, and I only had 10 minutes, uh, so I understand I have 15 minutes now, so I'll run through this very quickly. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about retail payments uh, today, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the, uh, the landscape of some of the different payment architectures uh, that exist uh, and have been proposed, uh, including stablecoins, uh, retail, CBDC, uh, and also I'll talk a bit about reserve-backed tokens since this came up uh, in the last discussion as well. Uh, and I will close with some design considerations and uh, a link to a paper uh, that I and some co-authors have written on this uh, topic. So I want to provide some context first. And um, first, if we talk about how where money comes from, uh, we can think about it this way, right? The central bank will issue reserves to private sector banks, uh, and those private sector banks uh, will uh, credit the accounts of, of, uh, of individual account holders uh, if the government wants to create money. So for example, let's suppose that Alice is doing something for, uh, for the government, this might be the way that the government would pay her. Uh, so the central bank issues reserves to her bank, and, uh, and the, her bank issues something to Alice, and let's focus on what that is. Uh, if, if it is, um, and I use the pound sterling symbol, uh, you know, to indicate uh, uh, sovereign currency, the, the actual currency that's issued in Alice's bank account is not sovereign currency, but rather uh, private currency uh, that happens to be uh, that happens to really reflect a claim on Alice's bank's balance sheet. And, and that's important as we, uh, as we advance uh, into this further. Now, if Alice wants to pay Bob and they share the same account, they, they share the same bank, uh, well, then all that the bank needs to do is debit Alice's account and credit Bob's account using the same bank, private bank-issued currency. No problem. If Alice wants to withdraw cash from her bank then what she needs to do is ask her bank for cash, and the bank will, uh, will uh, debit Alice's bank account, uh, which involves decreasing the balance sheet of Alice's bank, and gives cash to Alice, which she can hold in her lovely physical wallet there. Really straightforward. But what's important to know is that cash is not the same as the private sector-issued currency. Um, it gets more complicated when we have an interbank transfer, uh, because now Bob's bank, if Alice wants to pay Bob and Bob has a different bank, well, then we really need this, um, we really need this, 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 this system, the settlement system, rather. I'm, I'm sorry that I say clearing system. It should be settlement system. Orchestrated by the central bank facilitates the, facilitates the transaction between uh, Alice's bank and Bob's bank. And how, how does this work? Well, Alice's bank's balance sheet is reduced uh, by... Alice's bank's balance sheet is reduced by the amount of the payment, and Bob's bank's balance sheet is increased by the amount of the payment. But what Bob receives is different from what Alice gave up, because Alice gave up money in her, in her bank, which is a claim on her bank's balance sheet, and Bob received a claim on his bank's balance sheet. So these aren't exactly the same. But yet, because the central bank is orchestrating this, uh, this, this, this settlement system, and because, the, um, and because in many cases fiscal policies of governments such as deposit insurance, uh, allow the parties to believe that this is the same uh, zero-risk transaction. Uh, we think that these are the same kinds of money, uh, but they're not quite the same. Now, in this context, let's talk about stablecoins. Now, there are many different arguments for and against stablecoins. I mean, we can talk about the role in the crypto ecosystem, the role as a bridge, yeah, you, things you can do with stable coins. You might be able to improve cross-border payments. I'll talk about that in a bit. But there are also problems with stable coins as well, right? You can, you basically, uh, all, the, all of these assets, if they're kept stable, then that means that you can possibly lock up relatively liquid assets. That's a problem uh, from a banking perspective. 
might also have uh, systemic risk. Uh, there might be issues with uh, the singleness of money, which I alluded to earlier. And, uh, and of course, there's this idea that there is uh, some kind of party that's maintaining a peg, and the peg might fail, uh, and therefore it needs to be over-collateralized in practice, and that can be problematic as well. So stablecoins have, have their problems, but, but we have to understand where they came from. We, we like stablecoins because ultimately we want a means of payment. We want a, a way uh, to conduct transactions uh, that allow us to possess and control uh, the assets that we're transacting digitally, accountless digital cash, if you will, uh, which came up in the last, uh, in the last panel, uh, and I think we need to uh, understand uh, why. Now, central bank digital currency uh, is, well, let's just say that there are many different possible interpretations of what central bank digital currency could be. So I'm going to go through some of these right now. Well, maybe we could imagine central bank digital currency as being a better kind of reserves in which if Alice wants to transfer money to Bob and he has a different bank account, then maybe, maybe we can facilitate on the back end uh, an IT improvement that avoids having to rely upon the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the same kind of settlement system that the central bank uses. This could be an improvement uh, on existing, uh, an existing systems. That's possible. Um, we, we could imagine but it's just an IT improvement. We could also imagine retail CBDC could be a, a better kind of bank deposit, right? I mean, if people are really concerned about the singleness of money issues with respect to having um, their own, uh, uh, their, their bank's sort of private coin, uh, then we could imagine people holding retail CBDC in bank accounts, but that's not so good either because this money presumably... Uh, doesn't actually allow banking to happen. You're just holding these coins inside some account and the bank is still in possession and control. So it doesn't even satisfy the purpose that stable coins were really intending to solve. Now, there are firms like Ripple that say, well, hey, look, maybe we could use stable co we could use CBDC, some kind of mechanism for improving cross-border payments, this, this settlement token. Uh, and uh, maybe we could use settlement tokens to convert uh, from one currency to another, maybe as a way to improve upon correspondent banking, which has lots of, lots of problems and costs, as we know. But it doesn't actually address the problem that was raised in the last session at all, at all which is the decline of cash uh, and uh, cash-like instruments in domestic payments. So all of these kinds of ideas have been discussed, but what I'd like people to consider is maybe... Retail CBDC should be cash for the digital age, right? Maybe we should be looking at CBDC as an opportunity to make, to make cash become digital rather than uh, assume that, uh, that this is something that we need to build, bolt upon the uh, existing electronic payment systems that are based upon uh, uh, card networks and interbank, uh, and interbank push payments and so on. Maybe we need something new. Uh, and if we were to provide a cash-like retail CBDC, I would like to suggest that, you know, the, in the previous panel, the, the speakers had said very clearly, it's not going to replace cash because we will always need, we will always need something that we can physically possess and control to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be able to give to people in certain kinds of transactions. Um, and it will also not replace bank deposits because, after all, bank deposits are uh, at some level, for banking. And if I want to hold money for any non-negligible amount of time, I might imagine that there is some benefit to having this money be invested. And so it's not really a replacement to physical cash or to bank deposits, but it can be useful as a payment mechanism that can be used in the digital economy. And as we know, the, the prevailing trend that's, that's facing uh, retail consumers today is the rise of the digital economy. There are, uh, throughout uh, the UK and, uh, and parts of Europe, there are merchants who refuse cash at the point of sale. There are high street shops that close uh, and uh, entirely or perhaps only offer some of their goods online because of the rise of online uh, e-commerce as a substitute uh, for uh, those kinds of services. Uh, and in all cases, they need to make some kind of digital payment. But of course, this raises questions about monetary sovereignty, uh, and 
And we also uh, raise questions about whether whether ordinary households and uh, and and uh, individuals can actually directly hold central bank obligations. Right now, the uh, the only way to do this is with cash. So, if we look at it this way, maybe we can think of retail CBDC as being an opportunity to build something that's non-custodial, right? People often assume that cash is non-custodial and physical, and the alternative to cash must be custodial and digital, which is what card payments and, uh, and interbank transfers that we're familiar with in the, in the current institutional framework are. But actually, there's a third, there's a third way that's not being examined nearly as much as it should, which is this non-custodial aspect of cash combined with the digital aspect of cards and interbank transfers. And because we're missing this in the discussion, we're making assumptions that don't make sense. So when we talk about the, uh, the digital euro, which came up in the last panel, what we need to understand is the motivation. There's quite a bit of focus on fully offline payments, right? As, a, as something that has the, the right privacy characteristics, as something that has, uh, that has possession. But what's strange is that it's online payments that matter because of the rise of the, of the, rise of the digital economy. So if we put a fully offline cash-like CBDC in competition with cash, there has been research that has shown that now we'll have a worse equilibrium than either cash or CBDC alone. So why are we focusing upon the cash-like scenarios of this fully offline case when really what matters is the online case because of the digital economy? So I thought that was strange. I, I also would like to suggest that there are certified hardware requirements that are implicit that were mentioned in, the, uh, in these fully offline um, uh, uh, digital euro proposal as well. And, and certified hardware requirements have a, a number of problems, right? They, they can't really be tweaked or analyzed. They, they, you can't have a, people build by ordinary users. Ordinary users can't build their own, so that discourages innovation. And, uh, and uh, the market, of course, gives a privileged position to the device manufacturers, which is problematic. And, and the relationship is quite sticky because you own your device, which has hardware. You can't dispose of it very easily. Uh, like you can with even a bank account, uh, and it's a de facto bank account. And, of course, it introduces systemic risk because when it fails, it, it fails hard. And you're, putting a lot, you're vesting a lot of concern in these, if, a lot of trust in these hardware manufacturers. So I, I'm worried about that as well. And, yes, for the avoidance of doubt, online payments don't have any privacy because you will be tracked. Anyone who looks at your bank, anyone who looks at their bank statements will know that they're being tracked. Um, so... When we talk about this system, I thought that was strange. And, and finally, this idea of accounts. Everything is linked to digital euro payment accounts that are managed by de facto custodians. Well, that means that we can't have self-custody. The wallet is linked to the user's identity. And finally, wallet and, and users are linked to holding limits, which weren't really justified so well. So inside this proposal, the justification for holding limits was, well, we want to avoid bank runs. Well, this is very strange given the euro, because if we remember back to Grexit, the discussion well before Brexit, when Greece was having problems, it had restricted withdrawals from banks to 60 euros per day, uh, a very small number. And that was quite effective in preventing bank runs in Greece uh, while uh, the Greek um, government negotiated uh, around this. And this idea that we need holding limits for that purpose doesn't make sense. So then why do we want holding limits? when we could just as easily implement withdrawal limits. If we're really concerned about bank runs or systemic problems, withdrawal limits would do it. So I thought that was strange too. Um, but when we look at this, the ECB proposal isn't alone, right? I mean, we have other proposals like in the UK and the US and even China have very similar characteristics. And, and what I'd like to suggest is that this is a political, this is a political discussion and maybe we need to have this political conversation. And we need to talk about regulations. We need to talk about the potential misconceptions, like what is the European Parliament thinking when they specify certain, um, when they specify certain rules for how the digital euro would work. And yes, there are businesses involved in this conversation as well. And they have certain interests and certain business models 
And it's hard for them to see past those business models into business models of the future. And we need to get them to think in a forward-looking way about what it is that we're building, which means that we need to have some leadership politically. And that's a big challenge here. And maybe that means that we need to consider whether we're actually ready for a CBDC at this point. Even if we all agree, and maybe we don't, but even if we all were to agree that we need a CBDC, is the time now? When I look at the proposal saying maybe 2025 will start the implementation phase, how is that even possible? We haven't even agreed on the requirements yet. And I, I think anyone who's designed engineering systems would I think probably agree that you need to figure out what the requirements are before you build a spec, and then you need to get consensus on the spec from stakeholders before you, uh, before you build a, uh, before you build a prototype, and so on. And it seems like we're really moving very fast. I know that people think it's slow; it's not. And people think that we're quite far along this this journey, but we're not. There's a lot that we still need to to uh, figure out, and. In a shifting landscape, doing nothing, unfortunately, might not be a conservative option. And it might not be a conservative option because the digital economy is coming, whether we like it or not. So let's talk about another possible bridge that will help us get there. I mean, there have been people thinking about this. I'm going to talk about one proposal from the BIS, um, reserve back tokens. Uh, so um, basically, a, a Tirupam goal of BIS proposed this idea where maybe private sector banks issue certain tokens that are backed by um, central bank reserves that are linked to their issuers. And yes, indeed, not fungible, but, and, and yes, they do have some potential risks associated with them, but perhaps, but perhaps they actually move the envelope, decreasing the riskiness of the backing by having true central bank reserves back them, but yet also have, but yet still be issued by a private sector institutional uh, issuer. And, and maybe uh, that might potentially provide this kind of bridge that might help. Of course, there are challenges with this. Uh, so if we imagine how the bank, how the balance sheets of the issuer change uh, and the balance sheets of the central bank change uh, after issuing one of these reserve back tokens, we can see that there are going to be changes, right? We get new reserve back tokens that get minted, but we also see a, a shift where the bank that's, that's uh, issuing them, their, shall, their balance sheet shrinks a bit, uh, and the central bank balance sheet grows a bit, which raises some questions about where the risk goes. Um, this is, these are equal size pots, right? The central bank balance sheet grows, be, be, and the bank loses a certain amount of loans of equal size. That's interesting. So maybe there's something going on there. And then, of course, there's the question of how this business model works when we know that these RBT tokens are supposedly zero risk, well, and the reserves are supposedly zero risk, well, let's take a look at this other assets versus capital. What is the, the business here? Uh, is this about collecting, is this about, uh, you know, collecting fees? Uh, is this uh, something else? Is it about some kind of risk of the issuer's credit? I mean, these are, these are questions that we need to answer. Uh, and of course, we have questions about the, uh, the oversight and the supervision and the regulation of this. And, uh, and of course, I, I want to say this, payments are not banking, right? When we talk about the role of banks, we think about, we think about banking as being taking deposits and making risky investments and perhaps giving depositors some share, some fraction of the, uh, of the, of the income from that. Uh, but payments are something, are something different. And there has been research that has shown that over the past two decades or more, we have seen a shift in revenue sources to banks, to private sector banks. And private sector banks, a greater share of their revenue is coming from payments than before. And is, does this bundling of payment service provision with um, other banking services create systemic risk to this, uh, uh, to this, uh, uh, to the economy at large? Is this actually a risk to us that our payments are now bundled with banking? So I, I want to close with some design considerations. So there are some myths that came up, including some myths that, that were discussed in the last, uh, in the last panel. You know, is it the case that a consumer's balance must always be managed in an account? Well, 
Clearly not, right? I mean, I, I love pulling out cash in these uh, in these conversations because what's nice about cash is it's in nobody's account that I am holding this. It's not my, it doesn't have to be in my consumer's account. And this idea that the payer must always be identifiable. Well, I mentioned the FATF travel rule. Well, that's that's where this debate comes from, right? And what I'd like to suggest is that it's possible for payers to be anonymous and not discoverable and still enforce rules on the transaction. And there are architectures that can allow us to do that. Um, I mentioned Project Torbion of the BIS Swiss Center. That is one example of an architecture that needs to be looked at more carefully in this space um, in terms of privacy model. Now, if you look at the letter of what FATF is recommending, you might say, oh, well, that's, that's, that's no good. It, it, it doesn't follow that to the letter. Well, I think we need to have some, some serious discussion about what's getting replaced, which is something that also doesn't follow FATF's guidance to the letter. And this idea that in 1997, FATF had uh, published a recommendation that said that governments should encourage the replacement of cash. So even if the ECB is saying we're not going to replace cash, let's remember that the FATF said uh, two de three decades ago that you should. That's really important. Because that's the worry that people are having around privacy is really about this. Are, we, are people being shoved into having all of their, their, their locations and habits and travels exposed? And the answer is, well, yes. And this question about issuers knowing where all the tokens are, well, if you can create rules that prevent tokens from being transacted more than once, for example, or create rules that make sure that, they, that recipients of money satisfy certain AML uh, criteria and so on, you can actually enforce very strong compliance rules without knowing exactly where every single token is. So when people say that they have to know, don't believe them. And this idea that, that some businesses have promulgated this idea that maybe consumers always want to be able to ask banks to unwind a transaction, like maybe a merchant ripped me off or, or maybe, a, uh, or maybe uh, 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 some transaction, some, some money was stolen from me in some uh, fraudulent way. Well, not all consumers want credit or need it. And transaction finality is important to merchants who are concerned about chargebacks. So uh, this idea that, we, we're, we, that this is a requirement seems, seems quite strange. Um, yeah, yeah, it's almost, almost done. The, um, and uh, I wanted to say that, that there's the, there are these questions about distributed ledgers in this that came up as well. And I want to say that distributed ledgers are not necessarily about programmability. What are distributed ledgers for? They are for creating an immutable record that can be used to <clears throat> that can be used to establish the truth about whether transactions took place or not, which is uh, what is often characterized as the double spending problem. And yes, you can imp imp use distributed ledgers to avoid certain operational costs and risks, and uh, and you can have public oversight of the system operators to prevent them from changing the record of history without actually having programmable assets on the ledger, without having the ledger manage tokens, without having the ledger do computations. Like these are separate kinds of problems. And there are systems like Arbitrum that have been recently proposed that actually use distributed ledgers in this way. And I think they're quite interesting. And maybe we should be looking more at those kinds of solutions rather than assume that this is going to be UTXO like Bitcoin or or state transitions with smart contracts like Ethereum. I, I would suggest it's not going to be either of those, but that doesn't mean that it won't be, that it won't have a, a distributed system behind it. So I think that this just brings us to this question of what banks are really for, right? Uh, and taking deposits and making investments, that's absolutely banking. But payment services, which involve taking fees out of transactions, like acquirer fees and scheme fees and so on, and harvesting data, you know, providing data to maybe credit or lending institutions or insurers and so on. Well, that's that's something different. It's not banking. It's something else. And these functions can be separated. And in fact, if we look at payments as being a telecoms problem rather than a problem of banking, then we'll start to see that really the, the role of banks is, is historical based upon their involvement in accounts. And if we have digital currency outside of accounts, then then the role of banks will be different. And there might even be an opportunity for other service providers to facilitate transactions who might or might not be linked to banks. And ultimately, this can be about putting 
control of the money for payments back in the hands of asset owners, which I think is also a concern for them, not only for privacy, but also for ownership as parties such as the Freedom Convoy in Canada discovered when their bank accounts were shut off, which was effectively weaponizing uh, this, uh, this requirement of custodial accounts for transactions in a way that upset both the right wing and the left wing in Canada. Uh, so we wrote a paper um, uh, very recently and put it out there just last week uh, called Retail CBDC Motivations, Opportunities, and Mistakes. Uh, and we focused on the ECB proposal and also the uh, proposal from the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and also the Bank of England in the U.K., all of which are quite similar uh, in many aspects of their design. So yes, we might say that that the ECB is um, is different because from say the U.S. because they're not uh, they're, they they because they're concerned about certain uh, payment service networks. Well, that might be true, but yet the proposal is very similar. Uh, and I'd also want to point out that the Bank of England was advised by those payment networks and other identity providers based upon in their in their system based upon their um, their expectations about how it would be implemented, which again didn't do re- didn't put requirements first. And therefore, we're in this mess. So I think we need to re- we need to revisit requirements. Uh, so um, so with that, I close. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for setting the stage. Uh, I think we will have a, a lot of issues here to discuss uh, now. Uh, so, but now I would like to uh, invite our panelists maybe to join us here. Maybe Jeff, since you are already standing there. Please join us here at, at, your, at your place. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Ivan Mortimer Schuss. He will be a moderator at this panel together with myself. I would like to invite Mr. Filippo Zatti. Please, Filippo, join us as well. Uh, Ms. Aniko Zambati. Please, Aniko, join us. Uh, Ms. Uh, Petra Krijan. <coughs> And uh, Mr. Takeshi Kito, is that, am I missing one chair? Sorry. And Mr. Basil Samson from the Warwick Business School. Sorry, Basil. (laughs) Sorry, Wild. So now I'm changing the shoes. I'm going from this, uh, I don't know, what what this role is to the moderator's shoes. Uh, Yep. Please. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Leonardo, um, and thank you, everybody, for your patient attention. This is a really very um, interesting topic. It's, it's, uh, it's obviously an honor to be here to moderate this large and diverse panel. Um, we're going to try to spend the next hour and a little bit um, delving through a lot of the issues that were just brought up by Jeff. Um, and then, of course, we want to have a discussion with you as well. Uh, to keep this lively, but also to really interact between the different speakers. Um, And, you know, I'd like to thank Leonardo again for for this invitation, because this has been a topic that I've been on the periphery of, you might say, for a long time working with the IFC and the World Bank, mostly in Asia. um, uh, And Takeshi will refer a little bit more to this, where we've seen quite diverse circumstances, contexts for payment systems development and financial sector development in general, which which contrast, I think, very interesting ways with what's going on here in Europe. And other countries are extremely interested in what's going on in Europe. And bridging that gap in the dialogue is something I think that we all should take an interest in, in the central banking and payment systems community. Um, So before we get in, just, I mean, just recapping a few of the points that Jeff brought up, and I think which we want to try and explore through this panel. So I think the the first thing that's on the top of everybody's mind is this issue you raised about, is doing nothing actually a choice that is reasonable? Um, and, And this looks, you know, this is a very important question, I think, not just in Europe, but again, in many other markets where the speed of change in the financial system is raising this issue with a lot of policymakers. So we'll, we'll look into a little bit of that, what that means and why that's important. Um, obviously, we want to touch a little bit on the diverse, ge- you know, the diverse geography of this topic. What's going on in different kinds of markets in terms of not just 
Asia, Europe, Africa, etc., but also in terms of the level and structure of the banking sector and the payment sector. And we'll get a little bit of an idea from different participants here um, what some of the questions are across those boundaries. Um, thirdly, again, Jeff brought this up in many different contexts. There are a lot of questions about market structure, which are not of, often not really brought directly to the surface, partly because it's a very opaque market we're dealing with. I mean, most people do not get into payments sort of spontaneously because it looks so interesting from the outside. It's, but it's once you get into the inside of it that it, you, re, you reveal, you know, you see that it's actually a very complex and sophisticated environment. So, but also because some of the market structure issues, I would say, are not the responsibility of the central bank per se, but they relate to a mandate that we saw kind of referred to indirectly through Evelyn's uh, remarks about the role at a much higher level of politics. So we'll, we'll look at that a little bit and what it means for different kinds of intermediaries. And then lastly, but not least, I think there's an interesting voyage that a lot of the participants here have kind of been on, which as we start to pull on these threads, we, we actually start to ask some of those fundamental questions again about the legal basis of money, um, its economic role and the role of the central bank. Um, and even if we don't get just beyond, you know, we still maybe will get to the question of the international currency system, which also is very relevant. Um, so those are, I think, kind of four threads, th four themes that we'll try to unpack here and bring to the audience um, during this session. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Aniko, first of all. And again, like this morning, it would be very good if you could just also set a little bit of the context of where you play in this space and, and how you've come to it and what you were doing. And then maybe we could hear a little bit more about the experience concretely that you've already had in Hungary with your pilot. So please, Aniko. Okay. So thank you for the invitation, uh, for, uh, for, uh, our Croatian colleagues, uh, I'm Aniko Sombati, Executive Director for Digitalization and Fintech Support at the Central Bank of Hungary. And our bank is definitely not uh, famous for doing nothing. <laughs> but uh, so uh, right uh, after the, the launch of the uh, Libra and DM White Paper, uh, Central Bank uh, really decided to, to become active in searching for uh, for the future uh, form of money. And we started uh, this endeavor with the pu publication of this uh, book, which is uh, quite a comprehensive uh, uh, complement of uh, studies uh, uh, for all uh, possible angles of uh, CBDCs from monetary policy, financial stability, infrastructure design, and uh, last but not least, we have a, a chapter on, on the uh, possible design considerations. And uh, we developed our own uh, seven-step uh, design framework, which uh, starts with the question, what is the fundamental goal? Why is it necessary for the central bank to, let's say, uh, 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 interrupt the current uh, setup of some kind of public and private uh, 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 cooperation in the payments? Uh, is there any specific market failure that it ha has, to, has to solve? Or is there any well-defined uh, policy objective that would drive us into this road? And, uh, and I would emphasize this question because central banks are really not about uh, developing uh, current popular payment solutions for the general public. They are about, uh, let's say, regulating, controlling, uh, maybe influencing uh, the market flow, but coming up with a, with a current uh, usable product is quite a difficult and complex endeavor. So... Um, we have been also investigating the case for Hungary, whether we need a retail CBDC or a wholesale one or not uh, right at the moment. And since we implemented a fully obligatory instant payment uh, just before COVID in 2020, 
and we have a relatively developed uh, payment market. Also, we are among uh, uh, the few European central banks who has opened the balance sheet to, to the PSPs as well, so that we haven't identified uh, any concrete reason uh, to start uh, implementing retail CBDC right now. But we realized that uh, to be able for that, to build capacity, knowledge, network, we have to do something. So we uh, first and foremost uh, identified a use case, which can be a small scale, uh, but real CBDC, and which can, of course, drive us along the seven steps how to build up a, a working pro product. And this was the digital financial inclusion of young children, as Ms. Baresi uh, highlighted in the previous uh, conversation, that uh, children in the age of 8 to 14 are not really in the target area of commercial banks, but they are already tech-heavy, as Mr. Cosima uh, emphasized. They, um, they actually rely reliant on, on cash because of uh, some legal constraints uh, that they are not allowed to have their own bank account and so. Uh, and not, but last but not least, they are the potential future users of CBDC. Therefore, um, we uh, started to implement our own uh, CBDC product, uh, which I can demo you uh, after this, uh, this uh, conversation. It's called a student safe. So it's a free digital wallet for, for the children and, of course, for the parents because legally they are liable for, for the finances of the children. And this wallet uh, has uh, several functions. You can uh, top up uh, with, with bank card. You, can, um, you have uh, different uh, levels of KYC depending on the deepness of your, of your transactions. You can pay by QR code, uh, you can uh, split the bills, you can put conditional payments. The parents even can set some tasks for the children and uh, reward them with, with money. But we also have a, an incentive scheme, a gamification part with uh, quizzes based on financial knowledge, digitalization, sustainability. And with the, um, with the correct answers, the children can gain uh, digital uh, coins from us. This they can also collect, exchange, and later on redeem an, at an e-commerce company so they can get physical presents uh, for their knowledge and for their activity. And um, with this endeavor, we have a fully-fledged uh, CBDC we have all the internal processes, knowledge. We uh, actually managed to, to meet the very high security standards that the central bank set. We have partnered actually with two Hungarian fintechs, so it was quite a cost-effective endeavor overall. And uh, so we have a couple of thousand of users. We don't have any strong ambitions to grow but we have this solid basis who helps us develop our system constantly and, and collect all the feedbacks, uh, set the, the UX properly, and all, all these things. And um, so we are also active in the whole serum. We have been uh, observers to Project Damba together with Bank de France. We are observers in Project Enbridge. And we also uh, participated in the uh, tax print by the Bank of England and uh, the BS London Center called the Project Rosalind. But maybe I will talk about this later. Thank you. Okay. Is there any, like, would you like to comment anything on what just uh, Aniko said, or shall we move further? Is there anything you would like to point out? If not, then let's please. I would just like to, I want you have something maybe special, because I would like to ask uh, maybe Petra. Petra represents uh, Luxembourg at the Blockhouse Technology. So we have also spotted there is this uh, 
Zagreb or Croatian crew, or whatever team on your on your website, on your webpage. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? And what is your view from the industry perspective, from this technical point of view on these CBDC various projects? Because as, as we have found out, you have also worked on several CBDC projects. So what is your view from this perspective on that? First of all, thank you for a kind invite to join this panel. I'm uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here and participate. Uh, my my role here in the panel is a little bit different than from the other participants because I'm coming from a commercial company, uh, which was working on uh, including some other projects, but the projects of developing a CBDC uh, for emerging market countries uh, in Asia, and namely it was the country of Laos. And uh, in cooperation with some other partners and stakeholders, we were giving security and privacy model or considerations uh, to be used when implementing a CBDC. Uh, what is also interesting, um, CBDCs from technical perspective uh, pose a great challenge for anyone developing it because in terms of scalability, uh, throughput of transactions and almost zero latency they should have as a as a digital system uh it's extremely extremely hard to build something like that and there are also some different considerations uh which were which were discussed earlier today uh when digital euro was explained uh especially with privacy because there's always a balance between transparency and privacy in my opinion cbdc's are a gentle answer uh, to emerging digital assets markets or existence of digital assets. So in some naive theory, they represent the digital counterpart of the cash. And the main position of uh, central banks, I would say, to incentivize the use of such things as digital currencies is to be competitive on the market and they offer another means of payments or another means of currency. So there is something what is legal tender, but has all of the all of the benefits of, let's say, cryptocurrency, if you'd like to have something like that and use it for payments. On the other hand, it has different benefits for emerging economies because it uh, broadens financial inclusion, especially for unbanked or underbanked uh, population. Um, we were working on a project which was for or uh, such uh, such country and uh, the biggest benefits there was to introduce monetary stability and economic stability because if you have cbdc it can give you a property of greater transparency if we're discussing wholesale cbdc and if we're discussing retail there with the design considerations you have to be really really precise and cautious what's going to happen with the with transaction data, what's going to happen with personal data. And there's a lot of, lot of issues around it. But I can expand it further because... What do you think? Who should build that infrastructure? You said it's really complex. It's very, it's very complex and hard task to build it, to have this throughput, to have a, you know, instant payment and everything. Isn't it easier maybe for this public sector to build it? This is why we also sometimes think it, it, could, it should be, but at least the back-end infrastructure, the, the, the basic infrastructure, very rudimentary, and then to leave the industry to compete on, on all other fields. Do you think that's the good solution? Or, or maybe maybe the, maybe the even the, of the private sector should build it? I'd say it should be a dialogue in between uh, public and private sector and also academia because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of different roles in this system. So one is the policymaker and law, because uh, the, the software which will be running it or the infrastructure which will be running it, it will be a direct re representation of that policy. So CBDC will have to be compliant with certain policies and will have to serve as uh, promoting that policy. The other, the other thing is you need expertise because problem of CBDC can be a problem of distributed systems, can be a problem of centralized system. It depends in, on which design option uh, you decide you decide to use, but uh, it's a very interdisciplinary area, including law, including uh, economics, including macroeconomics, because we don't know what's going to be the influence on global economy if the speed of uh, 
if the speed of transaction increases uh, to the moment that the liquidity we have will not be comparable with the liquidity we have now or whether our systems are going to be able to hold it even and support it. So those are all of the open questions we, can, we cannot even model because we're not capable of modeling them. So designing a CBDC is an extremely, extremely tedious effort, in my opinion. That's a good, I mean, building on that point, I'd like to pass over to Takeshi. Now, Takeshi, in your role, um, not just coming from Japan, but there being a key actor in the FinTech Association there, having worked with a lot of economies um, in Southeast Asia, and also being um, uh, a close sort of ally and, and collaborator with the central bank and the financial services regulator in Japan, um, it'd be interesting to you know hear from you to Leonardo's point. You know, if we and and to Petra's point, the circumstances in which we're looking at possibilities for CBDC mm. are quite different, perhaps in some markets in Asia, both in terms of the existing payments landscape, but maybe also in terms of expectations about privacy or, or penetration of things like stable coins and cryptocurrency. Maybe you could outline for us a little bit what you see as the big contrasts with what we heard about the European markets this morning. Okay, yeah. So let me uh, introduce some background in Japan, context in Japan. So unlike some other European countries, uh, Japan, in Japan, cash is still king. So roughly it's at 35% to 40% uh, transaction in cashless. So that means uh, more than 60% are uh, paid in cash in Japan. Because uh, there are some reasons. So one is that uh, using or distributing and uh, carrying cash is not expensive in Japan. So population density is quite high and Japan is super safe. So if you lost your wallet on the street or anywhere in Japan, but eventually it will be returned to you, a couple in a couple of days, so it's quite safe in Japan, and also uh, um, the merchant fee of uh, credit card or cashless payment solution is quite expensive in Japan. It's around three to five percent, so that is a kind of a uh, uh, disadvantage of cashless payment in Japan. And in terms of uh, government stance, so Japanese government, central banks, or regulator is taking a uh, market-driven approach. So they are not taking leadership in building uh, cashless uh, uh, infrastructure, including CBDC. Because uh, every uh, Japanese regulator is uh, uh, taking very careful stance so that they are not disrupting the private sector's initiatives and investments. That may be one of the concerns Kosmin mentioned in the, the, the previous discussion. So yeah, they, they, so Japanese government regulators are very careful and also conservative on uh, leading the cashless payment in, uh, implementation. And the last thing is uh, the banking sector. Um, five, six years ago, uh, Japanese government changed its uh, uh, banking act and they introduced the uh, open API to the public, uh, the banking industry. But it's a best effort basis because as I mentioned, the Japanese government is uh, taking market driven approach. So, uh, Japanese banks are not fully implemented Open API yet. So, uh, this is another issue. Uh, and so, uh, so, we don't have any Open API infrastructure in Japan yet. So, uh, so Open Finance or API infrastructure is still expensive in Japan. So, this is a situation. And uh, so, as Petra mentions, uh, 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 promoting CBDC or other digital payments uh, method in Japan is a uh, uh, kind of collaboration or um, uh, ecosystem building approach is quite important. So uh, that's why we, FinTech Association and the uh, Elevandi in Japan is uh, holding this kind of public private dialogue and collaboration opportunities to the market. If I may just step in. Yeah. Well, it would be interesting to me when I find out how much cash is used in Japan. And one thing, it always strikes me, Japan abolished, this is interesting for you, Anna, in two, up until 2016, there was a, ma a mandatory payment of a salary in cash. So it was abolished in 2016. And then I think the fintech that because if you have a you know, financial system where, where everyone receives uh, his salary or her salary in cash, then 
how how much room there is for the digital financial ecosystem to grow. So that that was really interesting for me to to, to find out. Yeah. So yeah, recently that was changed, but yeah, historically uh, wages uh, have to be paid in cash. So this is regulated by Ministry of Health and Labor. So it's it's not a regulated uh, regulation, but yeah, that's a situation in Japan. And and in Southeast Asia, I mean, we we heard a lot. I mean, it was interesting that we had discussions this morning about eight year olds, um, and they are kind of new adopters. And you were referring to the requirements in a way and the opportunities to target new adopters. Um, what do you think? I mean, given that there still are, unlike in Slovenia or Finland, still large numbers of individuals and small businesses that are at either unbanked or what we might call underbanked mm. in parts of Asia. Does that change in the dialogue you've had with central banks and stakeholders or fintechs, the, the context potentially for CBDC? Um, I think so. The independent, uh, there's basically no unbanked in Japan, in Japan. Yes. but yeah, uh, Japanese companies, especially uh, banking sector, is collaborating with uh, Southeast Asian yeah. ecosystem. So banks are investing a lot in uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and India as well. And also, uh, the government is very keen to implement cross-border payments uh, infrastructure and regulation or policy as well. So, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, there are so many unbanked uh, people so, actually, there's no concrete uh, policy or collaboration with that kind of market in terms of uh, CBDC yet. But the regulator and the government is uh, trying to find opportunities to work with that uh, unbanked uh, emerging countries here in, in Southeast Asia. That's it. That's all? Okay. Uh, so, uh, Basil, if I may pose a question to you, please. So uh, during uh, during Jeff's presentation, there was also one uh, very interesting notion of, of uh, reserves in the central bank money for for let's say stable coins. Uh, uh, what do you think about this idea? How what do you think should about the this interplay between maybe stable coins, CVDC, any other sort of deposit money, tokenized deposits? What do you think? Uh, where the reserves should be and how how to how to how to frame this this uh, this new i don't know model should should we should we change it or how is it going to look like do you have some insights or ideas yeah. uh sh sure so <clears throat> um uh sorry i mean <clears throat> sorry i've lost my voice a bit here with a cold yeah yeah so well, so yeah, so um, when it comes to uh, stable coins and uh, you know banking arrangements are clearly a, a really sort of key design choice, right? And um, and they're therefore a very key uh, sort of issue for stable coin regulation. Um, uh, uh, they're in, you know they're important because they fundamentally underpin. Uh, the the sort of you know uh, the the value and uh, of the of the uh, of the coin and the sort of uh, you know the promise of the promise of power and this is widely emphasised, right? So in that sense, sort of quality assets are, are sort of reassuring, um, and uh, so you you know you want safe you sort of want safe assets um, uh, uh, um, backing your coins. But uh, you know, I think the choice of backing assets also uh, is gonna make a difference to what sort of money, right, a stable coin is. So, uh, so I think you know you often, I think you often hear arguments that you know it really is about making sure the coin is safe, and uh, in that sense, you know maybe you might want reserves because they're very safe and liquid, or maybe if you can mitigate the risks associated with other backing models, then those ought to be equally good. And uh, so, for example, um, uh, I mean, actually, in the UK at the moment, uh, there there are proposals that stable coins should be fully backed with reserves, with central bank reserves, and that those be unremunerated. And there's sort of one issue that could be for business models, right? So if you're not making uh, any return on your assets, then what's your sort of rev what's your revenue generating model? And uh, maybe there would be 
uh, hope you know maybe there would be uh, transaction based revenue models available, and that you know that's probably what we want, right? Uh, but at the same time, the potential you know business model implications uh, you know mean that I think we see many arguing for or maybe we should have sort of looser you know how to say more uh, we should permit a wider class of writing assets, right? So maybe maybe you should be able to make some income. But I guess the what you know one one point is your writing assets make a difference from a sort of monetary perspective, right? So as soon as you're, if, if you have a full reserve, one of the interesting things about full reserve backing is uh, it's sort of simple in some sense in terms of the, in terms of uh, the monetary implications because you have a one-for-one -one swap of, you know, one sort of money for uh, for, for, for another. Um, you show there's a sort of draining of reserves and deposits from the, from the sort of banking sector balance sheet. Uh, uh, but, it's not sort of expansion in the monetary sense. Um, uh, whereas as soon as you bring in, as soon as you bring in um, any sort of um, uh, other backing arrangement, there are sort of money creation implications, right? Because uh, sure, uh, and, uh, I mean, perhaps this is obvious, but it also, it often seems not to be recognized, right, in the debate. So uh, if, uh, if, if, a, if a sort of stable coin issuer gets um, issue a stable coin in, 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 uh, on receipt of bank deposits, right? Uh, and then invest those in, I mean, securities, right? Then security buyer gets the deposits, you know, have the deposits and the, and the stable coin. And these are sort of both now, uh, you know, a, apparently money and means of payment, right? And we, and we don't know what the, how that all works like in the wash, right? Those sort of be equilibrium consequences that aren't necessarily obvious. Uh, I mean, uh, the securities issuer might use those deposits to pay down bank loan, or it might invest them in other securities, etc. Um, so I, so uh, I don't want to sort of go into too much length, but I'd say, you know, sure, it's about uh, um, having a a, 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 um, a safe coin, uh, and so you know, if you had H, if you had HQA type backing, you'd want to mitigate the associated liquidity risk, run risk. But it's also about what sort of money is it. Uh, it's all. It also has impact on business model. Uh, um, uh, but then, also, I think you sort of, there's the question of how this all relates to sort of what state kind of CBDC, right? So your backing arrangements also have implications for what the potential relationship is to CBDC. So the, I guess the sort of full reserve, a full reserve model. You know, maybe it has an advantage that described. But you're also starting to look. You're starting to get functionally, you know, uh, much uh, sort of closer to a CBDC in some sense, right? Um, if you're having the full benefit of the, you know, um, uh, zero credit risk, the liquidity risk of the of the backing asset, and so then that potentially raises questions about. Um, I mean, uh, well, I had to say I've not I've not really discussed them. Um, the relationship between CBDC and say an HQLA backed stablecoin. But if a full reserve backed stablecoin, then it, it does it make sense to have both? Um, uh, and that's going to depend a bit on the design of the CBDC as well, right? But um, uh, I think I think Jeffrey, we've had a lot a lot to to, to comment here. Right? Uh, what do you think about this? So if I may step in. Well, I mean, I, I yeah. well, 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 I mean, first first of all, I. I I think that the, the question about business models that you mentioned is really imp important, right? And and if we look back to 2021, there was a G7, the G7 report uh, following the summit that was held in Cornwall in, in England uh, was particularly telling uh, because in this G7 report, uh, it highlighted that the choice to uh, preserve certain business models uh, was in conflict with some potential desiderata for CBDC, such as potentially privacy or uh, um, uh, custody or some of these other kinds of uh, properties. And uh, and the question about preserving business models, since this is a political discussion at some level, is are we in the business of picking winners? Are we in the business of saying that that there are certain businesses that we want to continue to thrive because because uh, I don't know, maybe they are systemically important uh, in the too big to fail kind of way, uh, or maybe they have been involved in operating infrastructure that uh, that has become 
de facto critical public infrastructure, and we need to continue to we need to continue to make sure that that infrastructure is funded. Um, these are the kinds of questions that we might need to to ask. I, concerning that last point on on um, uh, CBDC and and reserve backed tokens and stable coins at the same time, I, I I'd like to suggest that to some extent this is a a matter of of of, of a journey uh, that we're on, right and. And it might be the case that jumping into CBDC right now with our particular vision for how this ought to work, uh, maybe it is uh, financially sustainable and maybe not. Maybe it preserves the public interest and maybe it doesn't. Maybe people will take it up and maybe they won't. You know, these are the kinds of questions that we might not know. And maybe uh, a private sector based uh, approach to this might be uh, might be uh, an efficient first step towards figuring out what CBDC eventually might need to look like or or how that that infrastructure needs to be built. I, I know one one question that came up that uh, that um, uh, that uh, uh, Petra mentioned was the scalability uh, issue, right? And uh, and this question about whether scalability is um, whether we can actually have scalability by having a highly centralized system. Well, maybe that's true, and we can also have a highly private system that's highly centralized, like for example the the Torbion work, which is highly centralized and because of its use of privacy enhancing technology, also highly private. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, uh, it has some scalability concerns because it's not operated by, um, it's operated by a central uh, authority, which needs to run a highly available system. It needs to be a single infrastructure, which creates availability problems and risk problems. Uh, and there might be ways to uh, to create a better architecture that has low latency. Now, I, I don't think that any system has zero latency, by the way, I, I, even, even digital systems, but I think we can create, we can create scalable systems this way and, and we can do it with, with some measure of, of private sector involvement and decentralization. The question is what orchestrating role does the government need to have? Operating a system isn't the same as overseeing one. Uh, and there are many examples like best execution networks where we see decentralized systems that have been properly and effectively uh, regulated uh, without being operated by central government authorities. So I think there are lots of questions along these, these lines that, that will come up as we go in this journey. And, and if we look at, at stable coins or perhaps reserve back tokens or, or some other kinds of systems like this as, as, a, as part of the, the process of getting to a, a CBDC type infra infrastructure, then maybe we can Maybe we can we can see what happens. We can understand better how these are going to interrelate and how they're going to play with each other in equilibrium. And and I think that this also gets to this question about cash and CBDC. And and I I, I can't help but but reiterate. You know I think if we try to make CBDC compete with cash, we're we're not we're we're not solving a problem that's a problem, right? The problem is the rise of the digital economy and reducing the role of cash. That's the problem. Uh, and if we want properties of uh, our um, uh, strategic properties of the CBDC infrastructure, I think that we would want to be focused on the on the uh, on on the uh, online type payments as the primary uh, the the primary vehicle f for payments and the primary vehicle that we need to have the properties that we want. Simply because this is where payments de facto are going. I, I hope that helps. Yeah. So I'd like, I mean, that's a, I'd like to pick up on this notion that we're, it's a journey. It's not a destination, but it's a journey. And, and your question about, are we in the business? And I, we, in the very broad sense, picking, picking winners was also the question, who's, who's the one picking winners, but, um, and bring this question or set of questions to Filippo. I mean, I think that what Jeff's raising, you know, gets us to the heart of some of the legal foundations of perhaps three things I'd, I'd posit, you know, one is the the banking system and how we legally define these different types of assets that ultimately we're talking about. But also Jeff's kind of brought the discussion one step beyond that, which is, first of all, what's the legal basis of the mandate of central banks or other authorities where, where there, there's this constant play between the objectives of preserving the stability, which sets us off maybe on one journey but also enhancing efficiency. And secondly, the journey that is not just necessarily about the banking system, but about the financial sector, which in my language includes other species of financial institutions, notably, let's say, built on the market-based securities sector, 
which has different legal underpinnings. And and maybe you could, you know, by setting the context of how you came to this debate, you know, illuminate some of those questions for us. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me, Leonardo, the National Bank of Croatia, for the warm welcome. Uh, before answering, because I'm in the middle of two British here, I want to answer with the questions like, um, probably the governor of the Bank of England. The CBDC are a solution in search of a problem. Okay. Uh, just to start my, my, my speech. And uh, another aspect comes to my memory. Uh, I don't remind the name of the philosopher. I know that he was... Uh, sorry, was that actually a quote? Sorry? For, former governor. Yeah. The former governor. Andrew. Uh, yeah, Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, no, but all other than the, the former governor, I remember a philosopher, I don't know if it's coming from Slovenia or Croatia, that um, titled a book, Interesting Times. And if you read it and translate in English, you say, nothing new, but interesting time for a philosopher coming from this place, meaning historical times. And problem, we are living interesting times. When we live and we have this opportunity, we have the chance to clarify things or to make them even worse. And in Italy, we are very good to say that when everything changes, probably nothing will be changed. So with these premises, I come to the questions of Ivan. Uh, and the first one is, with Miss Baresi, Professor Baresi, um, three years ago, we started the research, as she told, and now is a book. But what is important is the title, because we lost a lot of time in the titles. The titles are interesting enough. And the title was Digital Assets and the Law. I come to explain why I say this, because of the question of Ivan. But... Fiat money in the era era of digital currency. Yes, because we are in a central bank and uh, do not have the fear to say fiat. It's important. Because in this case, we have the chance or the problem to reshape the notion of fiat. It's still necessary to have a fiat currency in a digital era, for example. Should be a good question to answer. The second point is digital assets. Uh, in Europe, especially those times, uh, we didn't use these kind of words. We prefer to say cryptocurrency, crypto assets, and so on, virtual, uh, virtual values, and so on virtual currencies, they think is important. Because if we create a digital world, we need digital assets. For example, in Japan, they had a problem before. The first time probably they faced it was a problem with the bankruptcy of uh, Mountain Gox, the exchange. And digital asset those time was an in an intangible, but in the civil code, in, under the private law, there was an impossibility for Japanese legal scholars and lawyers to adopt the intangible because it did not exist in the civil code. It was not represented. So, we discuss how many times to say what is a digital asset. Still today, we have a lot of working groups around the world. And we have this picture to have 
a digital representation, a digital something, a digital what? But at the end, the problem is not to give a definition because we have to say in the meetings, but we have to, we have to apply something, the law. And digital currencies is undoubtedly, are undoubtedly digital assets, but we don't know. And to come to the answer, because I have, I'm rush, I have a lot of time. When I take the banknotes that Jeffrey showed before, I don't ask where the paper comes. I don't, uh, I don't mind if the printer, especially in the Euro area, is in Germany, Italy, Belgium, or whatever. But for the digital currency, the paper, yes, the paper in the sense of uh, they mentioned my colleagues many times, infrastructure. It counts this time. I can't avoid to say what is, let me say, not, please, for us as scholars, it's very important to, especially if you are legal scholars, we are a little bit crazy with this, say that the specific words is not an infrastructure this time, it's a structure. Because without this structure, you do not have any digital. There is a disbelief in this, uh, this, this guide, an ambiguity. When we talk about digital currencies, for example, no, we say digital cash, but we have already, before with Basil, we said, no, uh, we can say electronic money. For a legal scholar, it's not electronic money, but when you use a current account today, you don't have a cash, you can withdraw that, but you use already cashless tools, devices. So the problem is different. We are not talking about the electronification, digitization or something, but of the restructuring is another way, is another word, is another word. So very briefly, because I don't want to uh, waste and take time to the other colleagues, uh, Financial, uh, financial sector, market base, uh, is very simple to me here. Uh, many talk about these kind of currencies, considering especially the micro aspects, the micro issues. But what about considering the macro? For example, it's possible to solve the the soft the sort of suspension that we are in we have in politics since the Bretton Woods time. I think it's time. Otherwise, we have a great problem. Interest, interesting times. Remember, when we open newspapers today, we we read about BRICS and the fact that we have a de-dollarization de of the reserve of the central banks. That's not the case. They match with the problem that we're talking about. So when we think to the financial sector and the market base, uh, sec yes, securities, uh, we have to think about it. Which kind of world do we want? A new world where we have a different balance between the main currencies in the world? Or, for example, we want, I comes, when I think of the reserve back assets of the bank, I think of the banker and the special drawing rights of the International Monetary Fund, or we want just one currency and we differently adopt. Let me say even, and I don't talk anymore, but to me is important that point, especially for our research. You say many times, we are, yes, the most important project in pilot phase. But think of the Central Bank of Bahamas. They already have. And they have a lot of problems to make, to, uh, uh, how to say, bind people to use these... Uh, I'm not sure I didn't, didn't, the name, probably send dollar. Send dollar. And they have already 
uh, the, the government has issued a few years ago a decree in order to impose to the citizens who pay taxes. What's about the fiatism? It's the same. So the problem here is with the digital currency, we make emerge the problem of fiat. And we make it emerge the problem at the international monetary system of what dollarization is. What is a central bank for small countries, really, where you have a currency but could be unuseful, as in the case, let me say, yes, El Salvador. These days they have found that they have more bitcoins than they think, I thought, but today perhaps they have reshaped their image because they, okay, we got it. But they chose and had chosen to renounce to their currency, the peso. And they have dollar, dollar, one from one side, and the other side we have the Bitcoin. So legal tender is not really related necessarily to fiat. I said, uh, I'm, yes, I heard many things, but nothing about this. Why? Perhaps you help me to answer. Thank you. I, I would just comment on how you started this, this uh, remarks. With like, okay, the times are changing, but please, central bankers, do nothing. It's better not to do anything, but to you, you only make things worse. You know, some, some, uh, to me, it was always the case with, uh, let's say, the digital euro or the CBDC. When I realized how would the future look like in 10 years if we do nothing, then I said to myself, we must act. This is my main motive, how I you know, got onto that and said, okay, we need to do this. We need to build it. We had a... Libra DM Facebook a few years ago. That was really a wake-up call. Then we found out, okay, something is going to happen if we don't, I don't know, build those roads or at least think what we have to do. So I think we should act. Maybe yes, it, we mentioned many times Libra, yeah. but how is finished? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, and probably Silver Silver Bank or Silver Gate Bank. How is this finished? I don't know if you know that the Silver Bank was. The uh, yes, Meta sold the assets to Silver Bank Eight and uh, went bankruptcy last year with the Silicon Valley Bank. So I know because I was at the auction that day. I uh, was the former Ministry of Finance in French, and when the news came out, he said, "Never through the territories of French." Absolutely, do, do you ne Meta? Uh, 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 two years ago, I, yeah. I was listening to a to, uh, Fed board member. I'm trying to... He was working on, on Libra because Libra and Facebook, they came to the regulator, to Fed, and asked them, could you help us design this? These guys said, all right, let's do it. And then they were like stalling for two years and then they smashed them. So they did not help us. You know? This is what happened. This is what at least, you know, he mentioned... And it's really interesting, you know, they were just trying to see what are these going to do. And everyone just wanted to see how to, how to find the solution. But they eventually failed, as you said, because no one wanted them to succeed. No one. I think. Yeah. Yes. You see how this is a political problem, mm -hmm. right? I mean, fun fundamentally at a at You're around court. Google. But like, that is, <laughs> but, but this is, no, sorry, we joke yes. because we know each other for many times. Yeah, especially, so, I'm a research associate of UCL and yeah, it's in it's 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 one minute, Jeff, and then yeah, we'll yeah, take sorry, questions so, from the audience. So just, just to explain. Yeah. Because, uh, so, so just, you know, so, so central banks, as you're, as you're saying, might not necessarily be uh, the alpha and omega of money even, right? I mean, at some level, money existed before central banks and it might exist after central banks as well. Uh, and before the Bank of England it was the first. Yeah. Yeah. And and the and, uh, you know, and, and we see what's happened when we try to force people to use a platform. And now, you know, in, in the UK, for example, the tax authority is forcing people to use this digital platform in order to submit tax filings for businesses, which is really strange. It, so when when people say digitalization, I think intermediation. Hmm. That's what I think first. Because in practice, that's what it's meant. Digitalization means intermediation. Now, it doesn't have to be that way because tech, use of technology doesn't have to be that way. But in practice, it seems like it always is. And this is why we, uh, and this is, I think, why we're, we're where we are with respect yeah, to... Let me say so first. The, you, the right word is uh, gatto pardo, yeah, if you understand in Italian. There is no translation in the book. 
I just, I'd like to pick up all those on, on one other thing there, Jeffrey, before we get to some questions to the audience is um, something that you, you raised, Petra, about the links to other parts of the digital economy. Um, you know, some of the people that we, you know, we work with in this space look very closely at the identity aspect of ownership of value of some kind. And, and some people would say, and literally, you know, we worked, I think, all with people that say that identity is actually the new source of money in, in, a, in a way which grabs headlines. But in both the digital euro um, approach, I think, and, and with the constant concerns that you've been raising, Jeff, around privacy, I'm curious what the panel thinks about that intersection between digital identity in the digital economy and the role it plays or, or should or shouldn't, I don't know, I'll leave that to you, um, in, in, in supporting or complementing some of these CBDC arrangements. Maybe we can... Maybe I can yeah. expand or elaborate on that one. So the entry point for a digital currency is a wallet. And the wallets can be identified or doesn't have to be identified based on the type of currency. If we're discussing CBDC, naturally, it would be uh, a natural progress of events that if we have states, uh, state-given wallets, identity wallets with, with our digital identities, like uh, digital IVs or digital passport or digital driving license, whatever is an official document from the government, that those wallets also hold CBDC. It's a natural, natural progression of things. But the question is whether that's the responsibility of a central bank or this is responsibility of a commercial bank. Because central banks in history never did uh, directly interact with uh, consumers. So the question here is who will, who will fill this gap mm -hmm. of building those wallets and how those wallets will interact with the full system. Uh, we can take a look uh, for an example from Bank of England and Digital Pound, where they intended to build two-layer system, where the first layer is the distribution of uh, CBDC uh, to uh, customers or uh, citizens. And this is done by payment infrastructure providers, which are uh, third-party commercial companies who are also participating in building this CBD system. And on the other side, we have a national bank which is issuing those accounts and keeping keeping uh, keeping a ledger, and uh, how it will be connected with digital identities, I'm not sure. But the obvious progression for me is that uh, if we have uh, governmental wallets, then all of the governmental things will be in governmental wallets. I can, I can see Jeff hitting his forehead, so we let us fill. So in English, we have this idea of a choice in act. I'm not a I'm not a legal scholar. Of legal, if I, if, yeah, uh, the, the I, I understand that there's this this property called chos in action, which means roughly that this asset that you own is the only uh, value is really realized by indexing the identity of the participants in some juridical context, as opposed to a chose in possession, which is about something that is directly borne by some party and has value intrinsically. And the idea that cash is... Uh, yeah? Third. Uh, in a few months. Uh, yes, there please is a proposal. Please. The, no, 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 there is a proposal yes. of the England Wales Law Commission, and now is becoming a draft for introducing a third... Mm -hmm. notion for digital assets. Well, well there is in, in England, well, in the UK, there is the Electronic Trade Documents Act, which some of you might be familiar with. It's really interesting. I, yeah. It's just under the surface because people don't think of it as being related to this conversation because it's about bills of lading, these kinds of things. But it actually really relevant because yeah. for the first time that I know, we have a, a, a government respecting explicitly the direct possession of digital assets yeah. as opposed to simply being representations of choices in action which seem to be the motivation of the digital wallet infrastructure that Petra is describing. Yeah. So when I think of digital wallets, I think of a tool 
that I can use. It doesn't have my name on it. It doesn't even link the assets to each other in any way. It's just a box that I, that I get from the store anonymously, and I can put assets inside. And then when I want to spend the assets, it's the assets themselves that give rise to their value, not the indexing of my identity. So when we talk about all of this identity indexing and assuming this is how it has to be done, no, you're just anchored to the current digital payments landscape that, that uses accounts. And I would even go further and say that when we talk of wallets in that context, those wallets are accounts, no more and no less. Whether you carry it around with you because it has trusted hardware, it is, th is a third party in your pocket, well, that may, that may be, but that doesn't change that fundamental property and, and it doesn't have to be that way. That's why uh, to say that the digital euro is the digital version of the euro is not right under my opinion. But it could be. <laughs> I, yeah, at the moment, currently, please. Interrupt here yeah, yeah. by, by uh, coming back to the uh, statement of Jeff that all, all the prevalent uh, CBDC ideas seem to be really uh, similar. So the digital euro, digital dollar, even ECMY ha has the same pattern. And actually, as I, as, as I hear from, from several sources, so the, the use case is not uh, extremely compelling yet on, on whether, whether there is a need for that or, or not. And, and, and here, here uh, uh, also referring to the statement of Mervyn King that uh, uh, solution for, for searching for a, a problem. So really all the central banks worldwide are, are uh, looking for this, this use case, which seems to be that the, it, is, it is here, we have to uh, use it. And, and also we know that, that the generally applicable um, uh, citizenship-based CBDC will be the solution, but this is not the case. So CBDC doesn't have to look like those that are under proposal. CBDC, in my opinion, has to have an added value, has to have something, something extra that uh, the market-based solution cannot, uh, cannot serve. And what, what can we imagine? So, for example, in Singapore, there is Project Orchid where they are piloting a CBDC dedicated for educational purposes. And, uh, for example, in Project Rosalind, we got into the final demo section with a use case where we used CBDC to help the government to subsidize the energy bill payments of citizens in, in the heightened uh, uh, energy crisis that we witnessed, uh, especially uh, last year, so that uh, real-time targeted uh, payment uh, support by the government could be distributed on a DLT-based ledger with the help of a wholesale CBDC, yeah. but uh, having uh, public policy motivation and not a general payment uh, tool. We'll just give Basil you have 25 seconds and then we will. <laughs> so I just wanted to well, throw out the idea or question whether the, whether the use case for CBDC is not necessarily the policy case for CBDC, right? So, uh, you know, is, is CBDC a solution to a problem? Uh, I mean, and uh, as far as sort of, you know, the mot motivations go, Different jurisdictions seem to have different motivations, right? So, in the UK, I mean, uh, non-UK uh, uh, companies sort of do dominate payments a lot, but sovereignty is not a mo not part of the debate, uh, right? Uh, um, there's no sort of analog for the you know idea of a for pan-European payment system. The the sort of policy case made for digital pound is very much focused on the importance of public money to private money. Right, so we keep saying, oh, and, and so, and, and at the top of that list is declining use of cash. But declining use of cash, well, but so what, right? I mean, so people are choosing to pay digital. Why is that a problem? Uh, and but um, you know, the point is, uh, or, or the sort of case being made, right, is the important role that 
public money, you know, historically at this point in the form of uh, cash, has played in uh, and, you know the sort of uh, how to say the exchangeability, the price exchangeability, the sort of unity of private of private deposits in different commercial banks, right? And sort of so, so, so sort of you know cash is one part of that. Obviously, interbank clearing in reserves is the other part of that. So if if you know potentially if that's the case for a sort of CBDC and public money, then the question is sort of adoption. And that's the sort of use case. If there's no use case, then you can't fix the problem. So you need the use case. That would be, it would be one idea, right? And uh, uh, so it's not necessarily that you're so... so and um, I think, you know, the problem, every, everything seems fine. So what's the, what, the no use case, no need for CBDC. You know, partly it's sort of the question of looking into the future rather than where you are now. But also maybe the use case and the policy case aren't necessarily the same. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, or so you, I, yeah, I yeah. think you have an opportunity we, if someone asks you a question. Is that okay? <laughs> please, please. No, no. Uh, yeah, I just uh, add one comment. So, because the yeah. uh, Japanese government is seeing uh, CBDC or digital payments uh, means uh, as a one use case for, for cross border data transfer. Because uh, all cross border uh, transaction payments, everything requires uh, data transfer across the borders. So, so the Japanese government is. Uh, uh, sub, uh, sponsoring uh, this agenda. It's a G7 agenda. And they're trying to uh, arrange a, uh, international global uh, data governance, so pro privacy protection uh, policies by utilizing this kind of cross border tra transactions through CBDC and other payment methods. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a, a good point to sort of start to hand over to the audience for some questions because I think we, we, We've, we've brought up an element we can bring to the discussion at lunch, which is use cases. I'm glad you brought up trade, effectively, and e-bills of lading. And that does link exactly you know, to the problematic issues that you are raising, the, that the G7 is addressing around data. Um, but I think we have, what, Leonardo, maybe 10 minutes left yeah, for yeah. some questions. We'd like to take questions from the audience. Please, Simon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Simon Anko, Bank of Slovenia. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, this uh, diversity of opinions in this panel, but uh, I'm still of the opinion that somebody fighting for the digital euro was missing uh, at this panel. So uh, I will take this role, if you allow me, because there are still some facts. Uh, everyone can have uh, an opinion, but the facts are the facts. So first of all, I can speak for the euro area. It is very different from Bahamas, for example, or Nigeria or China. Different uh, landscapes, different political systems, uh, different also use cases, and uh, the legacy, of course. And I cannot agree for Euro that the goal of digital Euro is to reduce volume of cash. It is just the opposite. Because the volume of cash payments is declining, we want to provide uh, society an option to pay with a central bank money. And we have to be aware of uh, typical uh, roles or features of central bank money. It is not uh, any money. It is an um, obligation of the central bank, which is issuing money. So losing it, uh, we would lose uh, a so-called monetary anchor, for those of you who are familiar with this term, it means that uh, it provides convertibility one-to-one -one every time for a central bank money. If we have only commercial uh, solutions or even crypto assets in the market, it is lost and it is important to say. Also in the EU, we have a specific use case, not only keeping uh, central bank money available, but also fragmentation because we are 20 countries uh, in the same uh, currency area and everyone is establishing their own instant payment solutions, Slovenia, uh, Spain, Italy, and so on. And there is no interoperability and to with uh, some questionable uh, success of EPI, we need something like that uh, also for strategic uh, autonomy. And I have to say that uh, maybe it's too early 
to decide whether uh, we will issue digital euro. I say it was clearly said this morning that we have not decided yet. We may decide in uh, autumn 25 whether to proceed. And we are not the Bahamas to implement CBDC in two months. I even know a company offering CBDC implementation in two weeks, but it is not the euro area. So time to market is long. So we needed to start studying the topics. We have started uh, back in uh, October 2020 with that famous report. Uh, it is almost four years now. And uh, what we can say at the moment, at that time, we were good in identifying questions. Today, we already have a high-level design of Digital Euro. So we are proceeding. And we have also involved, uh, as Evelyn has said this morning, uh, market participants, 50 people, experts from the market, participating in the market advisory group. So it means that we were listening and we are listening to the market. So it will not be something that the NCBs without experience of UX for the mass uh, adoption, because we have never done that before. We are aware of this, that we had uh, never have uh, before 350 million uh, customers. So we need to study all these uh, open topics. If you read our regular reports, which uh, we publish every quarter, uh, these are digital euro progress reports, it is uh, uh, clearly written what we have achieved so far. We have never said until now that we know everything and we have to work in parallel. We cannot wait for the parliament to adopt the regulation and then base it on it because without studying the concept, we would not be able to have a constructive dialogue with the commission, with the parliament. So we have to proceed, but the end decision, even of the governing council, will not be possible without the legal basis. So uh, just uh, to put some balance to the discussion uh, of this panel, uh, Leonardo has tried something I have added now, so uh, thank you. Um, yeah. To say for the Central Bank of Bahamas, uh, also in Italy, uh, a person told me uh, we are different from Bahamas. I don't think so, in the sense that every country, every experience is very important. And Bahamas at, now are a lab. So it's very important to understand from what is already deployed and implemented. One other point is, especially for us as legal scholar, not any central bank is the same. It's different for the economist. But if you think, for example, of the legal framework of the European Central Bank, and you know better than me, is the unique, unique central bank in the world that is established by a treaty and not by the state or the constitution. So it's something very important, very relevant. And before Ivan told me of the main functionality and main tasks of a central bank's uh, quoting the stability, of the financial system, but the other one, and nowadays is becoming again a reality, is the price stability, not the financial stability. And especially if for the European Union, you know the Article 1 to 7 is really relevant. Another point, 1 to 8 of the Treaty on the Function is, uh, should be avoid to issue two different regulations, one draft for the establishment of the digital euro and one other one, and never mentioned uh, many times, for the legal tender of physical bank notes. So the problem is about what a central bank does, but another point that I do not agree with you, money, uh, the mm, public money. There is not this, this, this distinction because the problem here is the power that they have the central bank to license banks to provide for private money. But it is not money. It was clear from the slides of Jeffrey. It's the production of something that is cash. 
and it is uh, misguided here. Sorry, I'm very on this point. I'm very, I want to be very tough. And the point is that the production of money is, is under the responsibility of the central banks because it depends on what kind of licenses you do and which is the legal framework. So here we have a point that we do not mention, probably, uh, seniorage, but that's one of the points of the reason why we think to digital, digital currency issued by central banks. So when you say public money, you say something different, in my opinion. The fact that the, the translation in legal terms is the only one authority that has the power to issue my currencies is a different, is not a way to... Uh, also, when they say, many they say, uh, money is a public good, where for the economist, everyone thinks about that. If he's not a legal tender, for example, we are at the box again. So it's not... Uh, to put in these terms is a way to avoid, and it is especially for us, as uh, researchers, it's important to think. Politicians have the responsibility to choose, yes, but we have to think. So, so, uh, so, so may I follow up on Philippa's re remarks? I, 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 I think Simon made some really important statements here about motivations, real motivations for the digital euro, right? Uh, as came up earlier in uh, in Evelyn's uh, 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 talk as well, right? Like, I we some large percentage, like 70% of, uh, of electronic transactions in, uh, in, uh, in the Eurozone are taking place using, uh, using infrastructure that is, uh, belongs to a different country. I mean, that's a big deal. Uh, and we're talking about Visa and MasterCard here, by the way, and, and some others. So let's be really clear about what it is. But there's also, um, but there's also, there are other motivations as well, preserving the properties of cash for the digital age, right? Like privacy, for example. And, and let's just say, to be clear that um, uh, a, trust, a trusted third party or assuming that we can force people to trust a specific third party uh, to not do something, not open the box where the data live uh, unless, unless they really, really mean it, uh, is different from and, and is no substitute for privacy by design. And let me repeat, data protection is no substitute for privacy by design. Even though some people are asking us to accept it as a compromise, it, it, it actually isn't a compromise because the, it, the, it is vesting the power in the party who makes that call. So, so there are definitely properties like custody and privacy and, 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 and having our own control of our own infrastructure that, that matter. Um, but if that's true, then why did, we defy, why did we design or why is the existing digital euro proposal what it is? That's the question that I would like to ask. So even if we can agree with the motivations, why is it what we've got? And I think it's... Uh, yeah, I will be very short in this reply. Yeah, because I cannot uh, explain for 20 minutes or even more. Uh, I would just say that this is the beauty of such an event, that we do not have to agree. So uh, this is the beauty, and I appreciate it very much. And just one last reply, and then I will pass the microphone. Uh, there is a large difference between the EU and Bahamas. Uh, in Bahamas, there was uh, motivation behind many islands. It was impossible to pay yeah. with a cash, right. P2P, and so on. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, send dollar is packed to the U uh, USD, so uh, no monetary policy and so on. Okay, sure, sure, sure. The rate is... Also, if you think of Marshall Island, it's the narrative. I, I want to be a little bit short and uh, uh, as short as possible. So, but uh, I, I have uh, I have my my university studies are in phenomenology and in, in philosophy. So when I see this discussion, uh, I, I'm no no personal thing, but it's kind of uh, the doctors in the medieval times discussing the sex of the angels. Because look, guys. So I'm the I'm the one that it is a, a a person that pays with money, yeah. And what I can understand, simplifying the the whole thing, and also as a tech startup founder, I always start something if there is a need for that something. And what is the need for this something that we are speaking about? It is the need 
to change the way in which the money are printed. Yeah, and we have a way in which we print money. We print it in metals, then we print it in in uh, paper, and now we print it in uh, in uh, in plastic. Yeah. So why should we go back and study the sex of the angels, with which we know that we want right now to? One, one second, please. I I, I yeah. Uh, uh, I want to ask somebody from uh, who from a central bank, not the scholastics. Uh, why don't you? When when Geoffrey said, "Okay, I have this wallet. I bought it from. It's a it's a letter wallet. I bought it from. I don't have it here, but anyway, it. I bought it from a from a shop. No, nobody KYC'd me when they gave me the letter wallet, and I, I'm putting the banknotes into it." Why don't I have right now printed the bag notes not in plastic but in bits and use a anonymous uh, letter or a digital wallet yeah and then use and do transaction this is what I need as a matter of fact yeah it's hard for me at the airport to get all the coins out yeah in order to uh, to pass the this is I believe the need of uh, CBDCs then putting a lot of things on top like uh, discussing the whole uh, economic uh, movements of the money but guys japan wants to do it because n not to get a, a luggage of money out of uh, the country that you you can put it in a digital thing so you had this project in hungary yeah why don't can you see a, a simple implementation in not printing uh, plastic foreigns but bits foreigns and that's it. Is it possible? So actually, uh, it's a little bit more complex. So we usually say that money yeah. is a is a is a society agreement. So I have to sh short. I as a central banker have to offer a wide choice. So the the king is the user. So they will decide whether they like the cash the CBDC or commercial bank money, I have to facilitate all. So, so you never have to use it. Uh, we'll finish here. Uh, we will have some also room and space to discuss this uh, later. Uh, I want to take, thank all the panelists and to Ivan as a moderator. I think it was really active and very interesting discussion. Uh, for making all this happen, I would like also to, to thank all of you for being here for so long with us. And I would like to thank also this expert team behind us, uh, Igor, Mario, and the communication department, and everyone who, who made this whole uh, event, uh, you know, happening, and the protocol department as well. Uh, here are also our colleagues from the Money Motion Conference and from Elevandi Japan who made this happen. I hope we will have uh, similar events again in the future. And yeah, thank you all once again, and see. Hey. All right, he's done.